Biophysical chemistry, good. Um, you know what, I, I'm going to have a recording of uh, the slide series. I can actually keep it right here if you don't mind, uh, otherwise we're going to fall asleep in the small room. From tomorrow we have a better room. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is really a little bit about what biophysics is. Um, the reason why we have biophysics in particular in this modern world where we're focusing more and more on high throughput and sequence. Um, because this is very much, this course is very much the connection between what you see in large scale life science, a disease, and the original cause of that disease. In many ways, you probably started that last semester, right? That in many cases we have mutations that's the cause of a disease, but why does a mutation cause a disease? And the reason mutations cause diseases is typically they change something mechanically, physically. You have, a, you have some sort of cavity where an um, ion or uh, any type of molecule or another protein would bind. And that mutation causes this cavity to change shape so that will no longer bind something. And the way we normally try to treat this is by designing a drug or something that hopefully either restores the cavity or somehow causes this function in another way. And ultimately to understand this, we're going to need to drill down into these interactions, understanding what's happening on the atomic level. It turns out that this is complicated. Um, it's more complicated than we think. And the main reason for this is that a simple molecule like sodium chloride or something that's literally simple, proteins are complicated because they contain thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of atoms. And the really big problem there is also we're going to need to start looking more and more into statistics. And then you might start thinking, well, but that's more physics rather than life science, right? But well, the problem is that this statistics comes back. Um, virtually every single new method we're developing has to do with single cells or a single molecule. Um, anything you can imagine is a pretty good idea that it has a single prefix today. And the problem is once you're down and looking at single molecules, even the experiments enter this complicated world of statistics and worrying whether things are correct or not. And it's a bit embarrassing if you see just the share of papers being published, even from our universities, that contain fundamental big statistical errors. So throughout the course, we're going to try to combine these approaches. Say one part mathematics, statistics, one part physics, but one part life science. And it turns out that there, are, in the end, there are some pretty amazing things we can do with this. Um, just to whet your appetite a bit, I'm going to start by showing you a couple of examples here. Um, so these are two big proteins. They actually turns out to be membranes proteins, both of them, but it's exactly uh, their exact function doesn't matter. So what you have here on the left is a small part of a protein. It's just four helices. But all these blue parts, they're charged, and it turns out that this is the reason why you even exist. Uh, in many ways, every single heartbeat, when the voltage changes across the nerve cell, that causes that blue helix to move, and that's why you even have heartbeats. All nerve signals, and the day when you were a sperm fertilizing an egg, it's actually voltage-gated channels like that that causes the egg cell to close too. But the cool thing is that these are charges and the reason they move is simply that we have a potential that's changing it. Very simple physics in a way. But it's, of course it's encoded biologically. What you have on your right is a ligand gated ion channel. Um, and again, don't worry about the details. These are just examples. We're going to come back to this much later. So this is a channel that sits in the membrane. Uh, and it's part of your synaptic transmission of nerve signals. So you have something, a small molecule, a neurotransmitter binding out here. The binding of this neurotransmitter causes this entire domain to somehow change shape. It's like an earthquake inside the protein. And this conformational change just pushes down on the transmembrane domain. And then the transmembrane domain here will magically open. And when this opens, you get a flux of ions through the channel. And that's why you get a new nerve signal in the next cell. This is actually something we're working on quite a lot on the research side of things. Um, because the, uh, these are the key receptors for things like all types of addiction, uh, anesthesiology and everything, so that you can actually develop new anesthetics by trying to match things perfectly with these cavities here. It's pretty cool. A more direct example has to do, there are, there are a bunch of channels and transporters. So channels, in a way, they're simple. There are, all these things are in the membrane. The channels are just some sort of holes, windows in the membrane. So if you open this hole, it might be selected in this case for a potassium ion, in this case for a sodium ion, but they literally just open a hole that selectively lets through some things. But if you only had that, not much would happen in your bodies. The only reason you exist is that nature somehow, at, at the end, at the equilibrium, you're all dead, right? No processes can exist at the perfect equilibrium. 
so that the reason you exist as the body is somehow is a machine doing something. And one of the most central parts of this machine is this purple thing in the middle. So this is a so-called pump, which is literally a small machine that pumps sodium against the gradient and potassium against this gradient too. So how do you think that works? How can you do something? So this, this does something that nature would not like to do naturally. How can the body achieve that? Right? Well, these are the channels. They, the channels move things too equilibrium. So normally you have an excess of potassium ions on the inside and an excess of sodium ions on the outside. So the channels, they just open up and let the ions move in the direction they would like to move. But the pumps does the opposite. That's they move potassium in the direction where you already have more potassium ions. Yeah, it's like against the gradient, mm -hmm. so then it needs energy to yes. work. And... So we need to get energy somewhere. And where do you get the energy in your body? ATP. ATP, yes. So this is a sodium potassium ATP ace. Uh, so it uses ATP that binds magic happens. Paul Nissen and Dan Mark, close colleague of us, they've actually determined some 14 different states of this. It's like literally like a machine piston going through lots of motions. It turns ATP into ADP, and while doing so, it's using that energy to pump the ions. Um, we'll come back to exactly how these machines work, but this is super complicated. When I was 10 years ago, we knew virtually nothing of these, apart from the fact that they worked and they used ATP. 10 years ago, we had that picture. Today, we know the structure of this. Uh, there is a small ATP molecule, and there is one of the structures of these proteins. So you can start to bend, and these are getting pretty complicated. And this is not me screwing up. Uh, the reason why I have this upside down is just so that here is the cytoplasmic side, and there's water. And had I had this in the right direction, the membrane would be the opposite side. So that it's using ATP on the inside here to somehow, as we're binding different ions or something, we're changing the conformations, and the end result is that you pump both sodium and potassium, so two potassium inwards and three sodium outwards. How frequently do you think this happens? So how much ATP do you use in a day? Close to 100 kilograms. So you, well, maybe that's a bit, but, but at least your body weight. So that when you think about these processes, and, and again, that's, that's in the order of 10 to the power of 25 molecules. It's completely insane. Uh, because every single such molecule, of course, you have to restore it from ADP to ATP, right, in another place of the cell. So the whole energetics of the cell is super complicated. And the reason why we do this is that you can think of this like a small condenser or almost uh, a battery, so that by pumping these ions to different sides, that enables us to later to simply use, this is a slow process, but once we have these different concentrations of ions, then we can use these ion channels to very quickly open things. So this is slow, but these have to react for every single nerve cell. And that's why it takes like 0.1 seconds for you to move a finger or something. That's a cascade of these channels opening all the way from the brain up to your finger. So we'll come back a little bit of that when we talk about membranes and how membranes work, uh, but this is pure physics. This is another close friend. I'll move that one away. Do you know what this is? You all have this in your bodies. This is hemagglutinin, which is the protein that is, acts like the drill when a virus infects your cells. So what this protein does, it has some fusion peptides out here, and this fusion peptides drill down in the membrane of the cell. And when you drill down the membrane of the cell, this causes the cellular membrane to fuse with the viral membrane, and then the virus will let out its uh, genetic information in the nucleus of your cell. It's a, of course, it's a stupid, simple molecule, but it, this is the entire reason why viruses are so amazingly efficient. The problem with these proteins is they undergo extremely rapid uh, evolution. So that ideally, of course, it would be simple to get something to bind to this protein, right? The only problem is that when they mutate, whatever, whatever new drug you have or something or vaccine is no longer going to be able to find the... Uh, well, if you have a vaccine, you will basically teach your body's immune defense to recognize a part of this protein. The only problem is that the virus will change its form of the protein so quickly that, say, a year later, it's not really going to have an effect anymore. 
On the other hand, it's, it's not magic. Uh, so what people are doing, colleagues of us in Virginia, you're going to realize that I tend to steal pictures from my own research. It's so much more efficient. Uh, what they're trying to do is that define the parts of this protein that are most important for the protein structure, because you can't change every residue. The reason why proteins have the structure they have is because they have the amino acids they have, right? So that there have to be some places here that are more important for the protein. And the question is, can we target those and find those sites? Then you might be able to develop new antiviral drugs. And there are a couple of drugs on the market that try to achieve this. But that's nature. Um, this is nature in a way, but it's man-made. So this is a protein for artificial photosynthesis. Much, much simpler and more efficient than natural photosynthesis. But I think right at where we are right now, you would still like to get the efficiency up by an order of magnitude or so. And remember what I said about energy, right? That if you could get this, so this could essentially turn into a super efficient solar cell that you would use a biological molecule to convert energy, sorry, to convert sunlight into energy rather than doing it with the classical silicon cells. And again, these things are on the market today. People use it. How do you think you create something like this? Well, so these are the cytochrome domains, and then you're going to somehow, you're going to need to, so this is something that doesn't exist in nature, so you can't really copy nature directly. But you're somehow, you're going to need to engineer a protein fold that binds the right cofactors, in this case, the cytochromes, and somehow provides exactly the right surroundings so that we can get the synthetic-like processes to occur. It's hard. It's very rare that we achieve it, but again, it's getting more common. Uh, today, we see papers about this in nature and science every year, that we managed to, ab initio, from scratch, engineer a function biologically rather than doing it in silicon or something. Hugely based on computation nowadays. So it turns out that, some of you probably know, there are a bunch of different proteins. Enzymes, that's basically the small biological catalyzers. Um, things like gene expression, it's always a protein and it's structure regulating it. Um, skin, hair and everything is structural proteins. Myoglobin and hemoglobin that bind oxygen in your muscles and blood, respectively, and transfer proteins, receptors like these ion channels. We're not going to go through and cover every single of these classes, but the idea throughout this course is we want to get, I want to get you thinking about what do these proteins do and how do they do what they do. An enzyme, for instance, what's the definition of a catalyzer? Most of you have taken some undergraduate chemistry, I think, right? Yes, but you don't consume the catalyzer itself, right? So what that turns out is that, as we're going to talk later, there's a concept called free energy that basically describes how expensive it is and how much energy molecules need to get during a reaction. And what, you, what limits the speed of a reaction is that you need to get some sort of very unfavorable high energy state in the middle of the reaction. So what these, what enzyme, what catalyzers in general, the protein catalyzers in particular do, is that if you have two molecules that you're somehow going to fuse or something, this protein needs to bind these molecules in a way to make this really unfavorable state slightly more favorable. So then you reduce this maximum DT in energy, and then you would magically get these two molecules to bind, and they can release again, and you would have achieved efficient catalysis. This occurs all the time in your body. Uh, and we're going to get back to that in two or three slides. So what this course is about is very much, we're going to try to understand nature from simple principles. Um, and that relates to something that I think I say further down. Yes, Wolfgang Pauli had a famous quote, you should always simplify as much as possible, but never more. This is the hard part here. And that's kind of what we want to teach you during the course. Simplify. Simplify immensely. It actually it turns out that, imagine anything, high throughput sequencing. How do you detect those sequences? Well, it, today it has to do with fluorescence. In the future, it might be graphene or something. But the way we achieve this is ultimately sitting down with paper and pen, possibly a computer. But to be able, these molecules are so complex, there is no way you can handle this myriad of proteins and everything. So what you do is that you create some very simple ideal situation. And then you try a well, first order model, something very simple. If you simplify away almost everything, what do you think would happen? And then the idea, you don't rely on that model being right. But that model can be so simple that you can imagine what would we need to do. And then you do that, and then you can go into the lab and test it. Did it work or not? 
So the idea with most of the things I'm going to bring up here, this is not going to be about making predictions that are accurate to the level that they can reproduce experiments. Occasionally they can, and uh, in particular in things like docking, early stages of drug design, we frequently do that today. But I think that the real power here is really about thinking about the why question. Uh, explaining complex processes from simple interactions, you could argue. Uh, a bunch of this is going to be a macromolecular structure. I'm a protein person and this building is pretty much about proteins, so I think we're going to focus way more on proteins than actual measurements. Um, we're going to be talking quite a bit about measurements and fluctuations, and what I might not have said here, we're going to, in fact, we're going to relate this to physical concepts. Why do things happen, and can we tell something about how fast they happen? Um, so why? The why question is probably the center or focus point of the course. And then we're actually going to have you sit down and do a bit of program with super simple models and eventually also do computer simulations of proteins and some pre-existing programs. Uh, this is still very much cutting edge, but 10 years ago when we started that there was nobody was interested in these things. And today you can't even see any nature science paper you see about a new protein structure today. They will also have run some computer models on it to see what happens. We think an ion would bind here but does the ion really bind there? And that we test in computers today. So computers are taking over the lab in this space just as they're taking over pretty much everything else in society. Uh, when it comes to proteins, this is pretty much gonna be about three things. Protein structure, protein folding, or understanding why proteins have the structure they have, understanding their stability, and in particular, understanding the relation. How do we get from sequence to structure to function? It's a really famous triad in protein science. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about predicting protein structure, but not so much from the bioinformatics point of view. Uh, it turns out if you just have a sequence and want to predict what it's like, you're going to do exactly what a bunch of you just did in this course. You're going to design a predictor using just a sequence. There's nothing that comes close. But that only works, of course, if nature already has something. What if you were going to design a new protein to do something? Something that doesn't exist in nature, an enzyme that has an enzyme that for whatever reason nature has never constructed. You're not going to be able to construct that by copying nature because nature didn't come up with it in the first place. And then you're going to start to think about can you somehow create or design protein structure from scratch? It's engineering. It's hard, but occasionally it works. Uh, so before I really start it, we're going to run this at 100 percent pace, and I'm, I know that you have lots of other things, but remember. At four lectures per week, the one thing I can recommend is try not to fall behind. I am frequently busy, but when I teach, I pretty much reserve the next five weeks for you. So I'm in my office on Alpha 6 pretty much all the time. I typically respond to email at least until midnight. Use me, use the TAs that you're going to meet this afternoon, and if there is something you don't understand, interrupt me. There is absolutely no point in trying to, oh well, Everybody in the class probably understands this. I'll try to read it in the book tonight. Uh, if you don't understand it, I can promise you that there is at least one more person in the class who doesn't. Uh, we're going to run computer practicals, not all afternoons, um, but say two or three per week. Uh, the idea with this is to give you a bit of hands-on experience. We don't ex expect you to be programming wizards. Some of you know Python really well. Um, the other ones from a biophysics program, have you programmed before? Mm -hmm. I mean, Information is going to be very hands-on. Okay, good. I think that's going to be enough. In particular, we're not going to grade the practicals apart from the fact that we want you to hand in a super brief report, max one page, to say, have you reflected about what you learned? Did you learn something here? Did you understand something? Is there something that worked or did not work? And we want you to hand those in within 72 hours or something just for your sake to be done with it. The actual grade is going to be based on a written exam, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, tentatively, the only date that's important for you, well, there are lots of dates that are important, is probably Friday, April 29th. Does that work for you for the written exam? I know that there are a couple of you that have planned travels and anything, but that's the good part here. Since I'm so busy myself, and I hate it when people want me to be in a specific place, we're going to give you the same freedom under responsibility. Things will hopefully be recorded online. These practicals you can do yourself. You will even get hopefully get logins here so you can log into our computers remotely. As long as you learn what you should learn and do what you should do, 
I like having you here, but there are other things in life too. So if you need to go away a week or so, just for your own sake, tell me because I might have something important coming up and then I can try to accelerate things so we give you the stuff, the reading material ahead of time. But for the written exam, then it would be good if everybody could do that at the same time. Otherwise, we're going to try to be super flexible with it. Eric, yep. um, we saw that there's a bioinformatics conference in Copenhagen that week, mm -hmm. and some of us were thinking to go. It's on 26 and 27. Okay. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. Does it work with the exam on the 29th? For me, it would work, I think. But I don't know if everyone... if. So in principle, I could certainly do an exam in the weekend too. That's fine for me, but I try for your sake, I try to avoid planning anything in the weekends. Mm -hmm. So here's what I suggest. You all think through this tonight, and then we'll decide the date tomorrow. We can certainly do it on the Saturday or the Sunday too, if you prefer that. Okay. And in general, the last week here, I've deliberately, even that Monday, April 25, that's kind of my reserve time. Um, so I expect the last three, four days of the course, that's going to be, well, not free time, but that's going to be study time for you when I'm not going to bring up new things. There will be some Q&A sessions if you want to ask me stuff. But we're not going to run full pace until the very last day. But think about whether that date works or if I should move it to the Saturday. The course literature I already talked a bit about. Um, the main reason why I'm going to push you to reading is the second eye. You're getting, you might not think about this now, but you're getting very close to your degrees. So within a year or so, you're going to have a degree. And at that point, you're likely not going to attend any lectures in life anymore. That's fun from one point of view. The bad part at that point, the only way you're going to learn stuff is by reading. Reading, well, reading books if you're lucky, writing, reading scientific papers who are far worse written in many cases. And that's why it's important to get used to the point of reading to learn. You're going to stumble when you read, and the idea that we can talk about this. My ideal scenario is that if we spend half these mornings just discussing things from the last day, or ideally the current day, and then I'll just skip through some slides. Overall, you're going to need to read the book to uh, pass the course, but it's also, when it comes to the topics and everything, the topics I cover here are the topics we're going to focus on. If there's something we haven't even mentioned here, don't worry too much about it. But in many cases, the book covers things in a deeper way than I have time to do in the lectures. Uh, and that brings us to the real stuff that I'm going to go through today. Um, so what I'm, my setup the first week here, we're going to start from the top and then drill down. Uh, so we're going to start talking about proteins. We're gradually going to see a, how amazing proteins are, but also getting from the large structure down to the very simple atomic properties and interactions and see what proteins really do. Uh, we're going to start looking at the architectures and the elementary interactions of proteins. Sorry, the last point I'm not going to cover today at all. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to, then going to start to connect this a little bit more to statistics and physics. So tomorrow, and I would guess that this week, if you have a biology background, Tuesday and Wednesday are likely going to be the toughest days. And that's also why I'm going to have you try to read that material a bit ahead of time. The cool thing is that all the high level stuff here is really governed by physics. And there are some very simple rules that you're going to learn that will help us a lot in understanding why things happen later. So there is something called the central dogma of proteins, and that's the thing that I mentioned before, that sequence leads to structure, leads to function. And you might think that this is obvious, but it's, I would argue that it's not as obvious as we occasionally think. Uh, in particular, the converse is not true. A protein that has a specific function, you might guess that some structures are more common, but function does not determine structure, and structure does not determine sequence. So in this case, the sequence of this protein is the amino acid. This is a very small protein called the villain headpiece, and it's like a computer simulation of it. Um, this one, the headpiece here doesn't really do a whole lot by itself. But the point of having this movie is to show you that this is relatively flexible for a protein. Proteins are in general hard, but they're not, they're not hard as rock. They do move a bit. And the motion and the structure that this protein has folded into is really what's going to determine what, what it can bind, how it works, how it moves, and function pass. For instance, on the right, this membrane protein that I talked about, the reason why this one binds something up here is that you have a bunch of amino acids around the binding site that have been perfectly designed to bind, say, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine receptor is a very common ligand gated ion channel. And then you're going to have a bunch of amino acids that helps us connect the signal. 
and then deep inside here in the pore that conducts ions, most ion channels only conduct one type of ions, they're selective, say only chloride or only potassium or something. And the reason they only conduct one type of ions is again that we have a very specific, specific set of amino acids that have evolved to be a channel for that specific type of ions. So that brings us to amino acids that you probably know a little bit about, since coming from life science, but I'm going to go through it anyway. Um, how many amino acids are there? Sorry? Yep, there are way more. There are 20 essential amino acids or alpha amino acids. Um, normally we're going to talk about these 20, but it's actually important to know that there are one of the most in, uh, important in uh, the nerve system is actually gamma butyric acid which is not one that you would typically have in your genome. Occasionally, we can encode special amino acids in the genome, um, which can be remarkably useful. I'll let you know why in a second. The special thing with an amino the amino acids are, these are the base, uh, basic molecules of life. And for a very long time, the, the entire reason we divide chemistry in organic and inorganic chemistry is that for a long time, researchers were convinced that life science or Organic chemistry, as we then defined it, had some magic life science substance in it. It's not just atoms. There is something that gives it life. This, of course, we know now is completely wrong. Uh, but anyway, it was a good idea at the time. Amino acids, as you can probably know, they consist of an N-terminus, which is typically nitrogen and three hydrogens, typically positively charged. You have a carboxyl group, COO minus, negatively charged. You have a hydrogen, and then you have a side group that can be pretty much anything. And again, for the 20 normal amino acids we have, we know what these side groups are, but there are others, and they will have other side groups too. Another very special, there are two more special proteins. Amino acids are called so-called ionic. Is that these, you really have an ion here. You have a plus one charge here and a plus minus charge here. Uh, I don't think that we're going to go through details on that in the course, but this can actually be important particularly when you try to model these or if you use them in electrophoresis or anything. Amino acids are charged, but their charge depends on what pH we're doing the experiment at. In many cases, there's a side group that will change its charge, but you can actually get both the amino and the carboxyl group to change its charge too, depending on pH. That's what Zwitter ionic Sorry? Zwitter ionic means? Zwitter. Zwitter, Zwitter comes from zwei in German. So it's, it's a double ion. Good question. <laughs> the other special thing with amino acids is that they are so-called stereoisomers, or they're chiral. Um, and what that means is that if you take most amino acids and you take a mirror image of it, you can't take the molecule on the right and rotate that to become the molecule on the left. For this to happen in chemistry, this is, not, this is a property that's not specific to amino acids, but you need some sort of atom in the middle with at least four bonds, and then you need to have four different groups. And you can, well, by far the easiest thing is probably, I have a molecular building block kit that I can upstairs, I think, unless I misplace it. I can see if I can find that and bring it down. But the point is that no matter what we do, this is one amino acid and that's a different one. They have exactly the same chemical formula, but they have different physical properties. Normally, if you took undergraduate chemistry, what people will tell you is that when it comes to stereoisomers or isomers, if they have exactly the same chemical properties, it's only the physics that matter. For instance, they turn polarized light in different directions. That's wrong. Because we're not in simple chemistry anymore. We're in life science. All these enzymes and everything, they also consist of amino acids. So an enzyme that does something you can't replace a left-sided amino acid with a right-sided amino acid in a protein. There's nothing that will work. No enzymes. We can't incorporate them. So in life science, even the chemistry depends on this chirality. All the amino acids are encoded in your genes, unless you're somebody very special. No, I've never heard of that. All genes code for L amino acids. The exact definition of L and R, you can look that up on the internet if you want to, but it's, it's not important from this point of view. But they're literally mirror images. Or rather, almost all of them are. 19 out of 20 are chiral. So which one is the exception? Yes. Yes. Why is glycine the exception? Because it has two hydrogen. Yes. The glycine has a hydrogen and a hydrogen, right? And that fails the condition that you need four different groups. And in theory, in chemistry, of course, you could, 
it's actually it's not impossible for the left one to turn to the right. All you would need is two groups here changing place, and that can certainly happen. This is called the racemization, where one stereoisomer turns into another one. But here I say that it never happens. They will not convert spontaneously. Technically, that's wrong, but not in practice. This is something we're going to come back to a lot in the course, uh, energies. In principle, this will happen like every billion years or so. Well, maybe, maybe every, every, every thousand years. The point is that this will happen, but the energy for it to happen is so high that in practice it will not happen on a biological time scale. Because you're going to be dead before that happens. Actually, it might happen to one amino acid in your body, but nature will take care of that. You're not going to see anything of that. And that's a problem, right? Because normally in physics, we only talk about rules. Well, we talk about rules that are absolute in a way. Either something does happen or something does not happen. The problem in biology is that we always have this time scale entering to. Does something happen so quickly that it's relevant biologically? Technically, I might tunnel through that wall. It's not an infinite energy. It's a finite energy. But I know that in practice, it's not going to happen no matter how long we wait, right? And that's for the biological, we say we can't do it. So many of these things that I say that will not happen or something is because it's not going to happen on a biological time scale. So why do I bring this up? Why could it be useful to ever use something with, say, either an L-amino acid or a non-natural amino acid, picking one that is not one of those 20? Can you imagine any point where this would be useful? What was the question So that. Now I'm talking about this from a physics point of view, and you could of course argue, yeah, this is a curious, this is a curious minor fact that there are some amino acids that are different from the normal ones. If say if you pick D amino acids, or if you pick amino acids, that's not one of those twenty. Why would you ever want to use one of those? Protein design, you can make interesting structures. Maybe. You can make interesting structures, but there is something else that would be interesting. So imagine that you design a new protein, I don't know, something that an anti-cancer drug or something. Blockbuster. There could potentially be a hundred billion industry. There's only one problem. This is a protein. How are the patients going to take it? What happens? It will be digested. So you now have a protein that you have to inject. Sorry, your hundred billion company just dissolved. This is sad. It's not science, but no company wants drugs that have to be injected because it's complicated, it requires a doctor's visit and everything. It's far better with a drug that can be orally taken or just as a patch on your skin or something. But the digestion, this is enzymes, they're proteins. And the whole key thing with these are locks that don't, so these are keys that don't fit in the normal locks. So by using non-natural or D-amino acids, we might be able to create a protein that is not really compatible with neuronal proteins. Now normally that would be bad, right? But in this case, not being compatible with the protein that tries to digest you is a really good idea. You would then be have a protein that you could take orally, but it would not be digested. The problem is, of course, you would still need to make that protein compatible with the, model, the other protein you wanted to interact with or something, but this is the reason. And it's actually used quite a lot, both in experiments and uh, protein design, to see whether we can do other things. The problem is that it gets kind of expensive because yeah, normal you can't do it with normal gene technology. You need to use tricks. Uh, since you know a bit about proteins, I'm not going to go through that in too much detail. Uh, sorry, amino acids. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to think about amino acids. You're probably aware. Well, you can't read this. Uh, you can think of an amino acid as a collection of atoms. Um, that's certainly right. Um, you can think of some sort of space filling models. Those of you who have taken the, uh, the bioinformatics course will probably possibly be aware of thinking of how you're going to create, build a model or something. If you have a very small cavity, or if you have a small cavity and you have a large protein sticking into that, sorry, a large amino acid sticking into that cavity, if we take this large amino acid and replace it with something much smaller, you effectively created a larger cavity, right? And that's going to influence what ions or other uh, small molecules can bind in the cavity. You can also think of a protein in terms of some sort of electrostatic potential. In this case, it's an arginine, so it's going to be very blue up here, which means that we have lots of charges, electrostatics. Um, there is not one way that's right or wrong here, but 
I think it's a very good exercise to start thinking in proteins in terms of classification. Some proteins are hydrophobic in the sense that they're not water soluble. Exactly why they're hydrophobic, you don't know yet. At this point, it's just a matter of fact. Tomorrow or possibly later in the week, we're actually going to be able to understand why some things are hydrophobic and some things are hydrophilic. And it's not as easy as you think. Uh, many any medias are certainly charged. There are some that are positively charged and some that are negatively charged, basic and acidic. We'll go through this. Uh, there are some that don't have charges, but they are quite polar and like water a lot, serine, threonine, asparagine, glutamine. Uh, there are a bunch of amino acids that are hydrophobic. And then there are some special ones like cysteine, which can form bonds between the two sulfurs here, between different parts of the chain. Glycine, which is really small, the one with two hydrogens. And then proline, which is proline is technically not an amino acid, but an amino acid, but nobody cares. Everybody calls it an amino acid. Um, and the reason that protein has this ring that connects back to the nitrogen, which means that we don't have the normal hydrogen on the nitrogen when this is modern chain. We'll see why that is special. I don't expect you to know these by heart. Uh, you should know a couple of the important ones. And you should at least be able to think in terms of classifications. So that, for instance, if you need something, if you would like a cavity to be more hydrophobic, you should at least be able to look up a couple of pseudophilic amino acids based on their hydrophobicity. Uh, so nowadays, I actually do know these by heart. But I'm old enough that when I, when I was your age, we still used a three-letter abbreviation of all the amino acids all the time. Nobody does it anymore. So today is a single letter because we use such an enormous amount of amino acids. Um, but be aware of a couple of different ways to classify these, and I think that's a good exercise for you to start reading in the book. So where do the amino acids come from? How do you determine what amino acids we have? Yes. Good. You're life science people. Um, I don't expect you to know this by heart either. I certainly don't know this by heart. Uh, I think I've used this twice in my career. But there is one trick question here. How many different codons do you have? Four by four by four, right? 64. Last time I checked, we do not have 64 amino acids. We have 20 amino acids. Why? Redundancy. Yes, but why do you have this redundancy? To prevent error. No, not really. The, the funny thing is that some amino acids, tryptophan for instance, only has a single codon. And you're not going to prevent error because the second it says CAG in your genome, but we don't, it's, not like, it's not like we have a backup elsewhere that we double check with. Because some amino acids maybe are more important. Yeah, so this is, well, first, we don't know this, right? So this is only what we can observe. But if you look at the relative abundance of amino acids in proteins, which amino acids do we code for? Their abundance appears to correspond perfectly to the relative occurrence in the codons. So some, some ones like arginine, which is a positively charged amino acid, is used in a ton of places. There are at least four different codons for it. Tryptophan, which is this complicated amino acid with two rings. We don't, there are a couple of cases we need it, but it's not very frequent. And nature has decided we don't need that a whole lot. Uh, leucine, small, simple hydrophobic amino acids, used a lot, proline a lot too. So that, for whatever reason, nature has decided that this is likely the relative frequency of them we need. This is the official story. And I, I'm not going to have some sort of crack nut, crack nut uh, conspiracy here. But the other, to be the honest answer, we don't quite know. I was down visiting a colleague in Tel Aviv a couple of years ago. And uh, it turns out that some of the hydrophobic amino acids here, they're going to be very common in membrane proteins. And we'll get back to that later, how membrane proteins are formed and everything. The overall idea, which I too subscribe to, is that membrane proteins are determined by the translocon, etc. If they're hydrophobic enough, each helix will be inserted in the membrane. But his argument was that if you look at some of the hydrophobic amino acids in particular, there are differences in the third base here, and he argued that some of these key differences in the third base would actually cause them to bind to some cofactors that would be, that in turn would bind to ribosomes that are bound to membranes. I have no idea whether this is right. I'm not even sure whether it's published, but the truth is we don't know. 
So that's, this could very well be a way for nature to say, well, all of these are arginines, but while we're constructing these arginines, in theory, we could use this difference as the RNA to target them to slightly different protein factors. We'll come back to what those protein factors are. This could potentially be a great bioinformatics partner for somebody in the future. The only danger is that it could, of course, be completely wrong and that there are no patterns whatsoever. Overall, that's something that I think you should learn. Um, one of the bad things with most course books is that they give a picture of biology, physics, and uh, bio life science in particular as being finished. It's not. So most of these questions, when you think that's a good question, we don't know what the answer is. So just start digging. Uh, there are more things we don't know than the things we do know. Um, so what happens with these amino acids, this is the key part in life, is that if you have two amino acids, you have the OH part, hydroxyl there, and a hydrogen from the next amino acid, they can go through a polymerization process. So it's H2O, so they release water, and then you're going to have a polymer here that the two amino acids have bound together. This is not a spontaneous reaction that happens very quickly. You typically need an enzyme for this to happen. Uh, so this is what goes on in many of these protein factors that we have RN, messenger RNA and transfer RNA coming and carrying one amino acid at the time. And then with enzyme around them that causes these peptide bonds to be more. This was first discovered by Emil Fischer in 1906 that proteins are a polymer of something. Um, but a polymer of something you, of course, having studied bioinformatics and everything, you're going to think that it's completely obvious that a protein has a specific sequence and everything. So this is a bad thing with having lecture notes, that it's not going to be fun, but it was actually not until 1952 that Fred Sanger proved that a protein, in this case insulin, for instance, has a unique sequence. With minor, well, at that point, we, didn't, we weren't really even aware of these minor variations between species and everything that came later. But when we really understand that the, a sequence of a protein uniquely determines its function, 1952, Fred Sanger and Sanger sequencing. This is a pretty remarkable paper. And I actually have some of these papers I put up on Mondo. Um, if you're interested, we have, there are actually th at least three papers that I put up today. All three of them are great in different ways. If you have time, I would encourage you to at least glance through one of those papers. And we can talk a little bit about them tomorrow. Um, today, with all the high throughput technology and everything, I think we occasionally forget how amazing these earlier results were. And if you see just the work they went through to sequence a single protein, and they used the three-letter codes for amino acids everywhere, and then you imagine the, the pace at which we can sequence things actually just across the corridor there and the facilitator. Here we're talking about hundreds of billions of genes per month. These peptide bonds, the yellow ones here, are very special. Um, if you are a chemist and you know all about quantum chemistry, there are lots of reasons why these bonds have special properties. Um, this course is not about details of organic chemistry, so I'm going to skip that a little bit. The book might actually talk a lot about different types of hybridization and everything. That relates to one of the previous slides I had. The reason why bonds are formed is because electron wants to be in a favorable uh, state. And sometimes these favorable states correspond to electrons delocalizing. So rather than just circling around one atom, they're going to circle around two, and that's when we form a bond. However, depending on what these atoms are and how many of them are involved, occasionally they, occasionally they, make, they form pairs or triplets. And that's the reason why you sometimes have these tetrahedral shapes like around an alpha carbon, and otherwise you have these triangle shapes that are typically related to having a double bonding mold. Um, and it turns out that the peptide group is an example like that. So this peptide bond, it's going to be very rigid or planar. Um, there are lots of bonds in this amino acid that we can rotate, but the peptide bond, we typically can't rotate. And it's a bit complicated because the peptide bond itself, we usually don't draw as a double bond. But it says this whole quartet of hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, that will cause that one to be very, very stiff. And what you see here is pretty much the same as you had in the previous slide. That they form a pair and they release water. In practice, what you need to know, peptide bonds, very, very stiff. They hardly ever rotate. We'll come back to that. So how many amino acids do you ever assemble in a protein? What's the size of a typical protein?
Yeah, the 50 would be very small. Physicists or physical chemists, people who love to tinker, they kind of argue that they can create proteins like 20 residues or something. Most chemists would probably call that a polypeptide. There is, there is no sharp limit between poly anything with more than one pep amino acid is called a polypeptide. Typically, we draw the limit somewhere when you start having some amino acids or residues, as we call it, that are buried, that some that are not exposed to water. And then you somehow argue that we have a structure that's large enough to call it a protein. Uh, and that would start something like that 25. But 25 is the extreme minimum. Even 50 is a very small protein. And as you see on the list on the next slide, this just keeps going up. There are some insanely large proteins with 30,000 residues. Um, and that is part of your muscles, actually. I'm going to show you an example of that in a couple of cases. The reason why we historically, most pictures of protein you've seen have been the small ones. And that's simply because their structures have historically been easy to determine. Uh, almost all the really large ones here correspond to Nobel Prizes. Uh, well, not to me yet, but... RNA polymerase, certainly a Nobel Prize. The ribosomes that we're going to look at later have been uh, got a Nobel Prize award for the work and everything. So it's, it's insane how large proteins you can have with these molecular weights of half a million Dalton or something. Typically, we divide these in three classes. I'm not going to talk so much about these classes today. Well, maybe a bit. But since the book does it, I figured I should cover it at least. And then we're going to come back to this after the Easter break. The first class is the most boring one that we're not really going to talk about a lot. Fibrous proteins, uh, nail, hair, skin, mm. occasionally bones too, but bones, the, the most important uh, part of bones is technically not proteins. Uh, these are very boring structures, they're long repeating and everything, usually lots of bonds in them, and uh, we're going to come back and actually look what the structure of your hair is later on. You typically can solve it, um, then they're by definition they're very strong. They're not particularly interesting for us, so I'm usually going to skip them. By far the most common proteins are globular or water soluble proteins. Uh, think of these as small balls that are dissolved in water. They can be super complex in the way that there are no simple rules for their structures. You saw that in the bioinformatics course, they can have helices, they can have beta sheets. They can have combinations of them, they can keep pretty much everything, and they typically have lots of small groups bound. But this makes them very interesting, and we're for that reason, we're, I think we're going to spend most of the time looking at globular proteins. Although, this is another problem. When I was your age, we pretty much only cared about globular proteins. Why? So it's only purified? Well, it's worse than that. Uh, so when I was maybe, well, no, about your age, uh, in Lund in the 1990s, there were, I remember Sture Forsé in my lecture of physical chemistry had us strike out the line in the compendium because he said that, well, in the compendium it was written that we now know 50 protein structures and that was 300 instead of 50. So how many protein structures do you know today? more, I would say close to 50,000. It's so many that I, I, I should know exactly, but I didn't even bother looking it up. It, it's a number that's, that's probably data bank has grown so large that I no longer keep track of it. But in my days, virtually all these protein structures were globular proteins because it was super hard to determine any structures of membrane proteins. The first membrane protein structures were Nobel Prizes too. So that's something that has changed just the last 10 years. Now we actually starting to have a bunch of structures of membrane proteins. And the difference here is that the membrane proteins, they don't exist in water, but they are in this lipid environment in the cellular membrane. That's a problem. Because something that likes to live in oil is not going to be very easy to crystallize. And that's why we can't determine structures of them. Uh, exactly how you determine structures of them is a long chapter. We can get back to that later. But typically you try to attach an antibody or something to this membrane protein and then you essentially crystallize the antibody but you're not really interested in the antibody but as part of this crystal you also get a small appendix which is the protein you're interested in but that, that can fail in quite a few remarkable ways. The important thing with membrane proteins is that they're because they are the doors and windows of our cells they're usually tuper super physical and super functional. They correspond to nerve signaling, and they correspond to energy factors. They always do something and it's very clear what they do. Uh, globular proteins are much more subtle, better or worse. Uh, I realize the clock is it's 10 a.m. right now. I'm going to give you to either 
So we do, it's probably easier if we run another 20 minutes or so, and then I give you a slightly longer break, and then we continue about an hour until lunch, because if we take two breaks, both of them are gonna be really short. So if you look, you have assembled proteins, uh, an assembled membrane protein, and here you have a hemoglobin subunit. Hemoglobin actually consists of four of these. Here you also see something small in red, which is a protoporphyrin actually. But when you have a protoporphyrin with iron in it, it's called a heme group. And that is the group responsible for binding oxygen in your blood. It's actually why, the reason why your blood is red too, because you have the iron here. And when light hits this, that's what makes the blood red. You have tons of these proteins in blood. You have a slightly different protein in your muscles called myoglobin, very closely related. And that's something that you should think about. I will come back to this. But So if you have hemoglobin binding, obviously, oxygen in your lungs, how will hemoglobin release the oxygen to the myoglobin? It would be very slow. Enzymes in theory and enzyme could work. It doesn't work that way. Myoglobin. I'm not going to tell you that, sir. Myoglobin has more affinity for oxygen. Yes, than... but, but that's not easy, right? Because Rather, it would be easy to have myoglobin have higher affinity to bind oxygen stronger if hemoglobin was bad at binding oxygen. But if hemoglobin was bad at binding oxygen, it would not really bind a whole lot of oxygen in your lungs, right? And that would be remarkably inefficient. So the, the caveat here, hemoglobin is excellent at binding oxygen. Myoglobin is also excellent at binding oxygen. But somehow hemoglobin has to be a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When hemoglobin is in the lungs, it has to be insanely good at binding oxygen. But when it's suddenly out in the muscles, it has to switch character and suddenly be bad at binding oxygen so that it gives it out to myoglobin instead. We'll cover that later in the course that you might know the answer of that. But these are small proteins. The other extreme examples is the titin I mentioned. So this is part of your muscles. Uh, you might have covered this a bit in the course at Karolinska, but if you look at a muscle fiber or muscle bundle, uh, deep in this uh, fibers you have something called a myofibril, and now I'm skipping over a couple of levels here. Uh, anybody at the Karolinska Institute would kill me, but that's fine. And far down in these fibrils, you have something called a sarcomere. And again, this course is not about muscles, so don't worry, I'm not gonna... Uh, but if you keep digging in here, there are a bunch of different parts of these sarcomeres, um, and in particular, there are a bunch of different proteins. And one of them is called myosin, that has to do with part of this, and then there are other parts very close to it, where you have both actin, but also some strange chains of a bunch of small proteins here. And it turns out that this chain says, so sorry, it's 244 different domains tied together, this chain. So it's a really, most proteins would somehow coil up and form a ball or something, right? But this one is pretty much extended, so you have one domain after the other, and a bunch of these domains look something like this. So you have a chain coming in here, and then a bunch of beta sheets in this case going back and forth. We'll cover what the beta sheets do later. And then we'll continue with another domain going back and forth rolled up. So what these do is that every time you move a muscle, if we apply force here, each of these domains will actually unfold. And then when we no longer have a force applied, they will refold again. So this is what gives muscles its elasticity. It's a protein. And it folds and unfolds in like fraction, a uh, microsecond or something. So this is the entire reason why muscles work. And that's why it's so gigantic, right? It's these 244 different domains that gives us the 30,000 amino acids in total. And we, nobody has determined the structure of the entire protein, but we have structures of the subunits. And that brings us something else, that how hard are proteins? Well, the book says something. I would not necessarily agree to 100% with the book, but overall, if you look at a single domain, that is kind of like a small football or something, but not quite. Proteins do move. They're hard in the sense that it's not like a squishy ball that you can deform them. But don't think of a protein like a crystal. Uh, the book might even have said that, well, sorry, a solid protein behaves like a crystal. That's not quite true. Um, that's the way we see protein structures. But there is a problem with that. How do we determine protein structures? Crystal? Yes, I'll get to that in the next slide. The protein structures are typically <laughs> determined at around 100 Kelvin. And I'm not sure with you, but if I take my cup of coffee and 
which is definitely not like a crystal. But if I now pour liquid nitrogen in that and put it at 100 Kelvin, suddenly it's going to be like a crystal. That doesn't mean that coffee behaves like a crystal. So the scary thing here is that we know relatively little about it. This was one of the first strong results that people achieved with simulations in the 1970s that we actually realized that Gobi is moved. And so five years later, we can, we can see that in this called D-factor. So we can see how fussy different parts of the crystals are. So that's beyond this course, I'm not going to go through. Uh, and for larger proteins, this is even more pronounced. Multi-domain is titine that I showed you, right? That, that's entirely flexible. And in general, the more domains and the larger a protein is, the more it has to move. That's the entire reason why you need those multiple domains. If it was just something small, it costs time, energy, and everything for nature to build something larger. So if you can achieve something with a small protein, it's much better. The only reason to create a gigantic protein is that we somehow need it. And that's either because in the case of nails, skin, that we need to cover a large area, or in the case of these machines that we need to achieve something very complicated. And the complicated parts usually has to do with motion. And that leads to some key of a folding in particular. A protein, when we say that a normal protein, a native protein or something, it's always, it is well defined in the sense that it's, it might be a bit flexible, but all the, the amino acids, the neighbors with which an amino acid interact are usually constant. It's the same, that doesn't change. And that means that a protein is it's kind of stable. You keep heating a protein, it will work, will work, will work, will work until it no longer works, until it denaturates. And that is usually a very abrupt process. Um, so it appears that the stability of a protein is like all or nothing, like a light bulb. It's either broken or not. It's not kind of broken, unlike the projector here that's wearing out. And that brings us to how we determine these structures. X-ray crystallography. Uh, this is not really a course in X-ray crystallography, but it's important to know about this because there are some amazing things here, but there are also some large shortcomings. What this is, is a tiny crystal. Uh, and they here have some sort of holder. Typically, to be able to determine the structure of proteins, we need a couple of milligrams or something. And that can be a gigantic challenge, just to overexpress and purify that amount of protein. Uh, we're getting much better at that now. Some 15, 20 years ago, you could pretty much never achieve that for a membrane protein, but today we can. The only problem is that there's not enough to have a lot of protein. You also need this protein to form a crystal. I'll tell you why on the next slide. Um, no, actually, no, it's going to be in this slide. But the problem is that many things won't crystallize. In particular, membrane proteins, they are in oil. But if, assuming that you were really lucky and you could create a small perfect crystal where you have billions and billions of perfect copies of your proteins sitting next to each other in some sort of crystal, then you can use a synchrotron. And this is a brand new synchrotron down in Lund called Max4 that it's actually not in use yet, but they turned on the electron beam this fall. Uh, so it's just a couple of months old. This is going to be one of the brightest synchrotrons in the world. So if you're interested in working in structural work, there are likely going to be a bunch of opportunities down in there. So what you do with an X-ray is that we have our small sample, and then we shine an X-ray on it. And that, in principle, is a topic for an entire course. But if you've ever been a kid and played in water, you might realize that if you pick your fingers or something in water or just play around with it, you create waves, right? And depending on what you do and how quickly you, you can get some of these waves to either cancel or amplify each other. So sometimes you can cause some waves to be larger than others. And you can think of this, if I keep picking here, there are some circular waves going out. And they have another wave going out here. And at some points, these will start to intersect. And at this point where they will intersect, when they are in phase, that both of these are going up, I'm actually going to get a signal that's twice as high. But where they're out of phase, they will cancel. So what happens here is that it's not just a single molecule we're shining at, but billions and billions and billions of molecules. And that corresponds to having billions of fingers pointing in the water at one time. So that depending on the relative orientation of, not the atoms actually, but technically it's the electrons. Um, the electrons will scatter our photons here, and then you're going to get a very characteristic pattern here that corresponds to the frequencies and orientations that were favorable, then we we amplified things. And then you get something that looks roughly like the picture here in the middle. This is not dirty, but the small black points here are these so-called constructive interference. 
And if I were an X-ray crystallographer, which I'm not, then I should, a good X-ray crystallographer can actually start to say something about the general shape of the sample or something just by looking at the sample and the general, the general shape of the orthic. The white point you see here is the holder there. And typically, today we no longer use film, as it says up there. Today you would have a camera. What you then do is that today we put this in computers and throw tons of computing time on it. Actually, not so much. And then from that, we can deduce the blue shape you see here. And the blue shape here is really the electron density. Because again, it's the electrons we're scattering. But based on where the electrons are, we can then let the computers try to fit this. And ideally, in this case, we call it that we have traced a backbone in here. So you have been able to guess what residues are where and how does the protein backbone fit in this electron density. The reason why I'm showing you this is that we frequently think of experiments as somehow an experiment is the opposite of a theory or a calculation, right? But the point is that the only experimental result here is this one. The structure is technically it's an experimental structure, but there is quite a lot of modeling that has gone into this step. And in particular, I'm not sure how good you are, but where are the hydrogens? You don't see the hydrogens because hydrogens hardly have any electrons, so they're not going to scatter. So all the hydrogens you ever see in a sample are usually we have to place them there with a computer. Now, in case of hydrogens, it's kind of easy because they know they're pretty much one angstrom away from the carbon, so that's trivial. But even if you have a low resolution structure, it's certainly possible to make errors here. So that there is more modeling involved in an experiment than you think. Uh, and we're going to come back to that many times in the course. Models are not limited to theoretical chemistry. Mm. So what did we do before we had computers? So, uh, yeah. so this is one of the first structures, hemoglobin. Max Perutz, amazing biophysicist. It took them 22 years to do the first structure. Can you imagine? Just starting where you are now. Like, it is one thing to start and do a 22 year poly if you know you would get the structure. But they didn't. nobody had ever done this before. At the point, people weren't even sure whether proteins were rigid or not. They kind of started before, actually, they must have started their work before Fred Sanger published the result that protein had a unique amino acid sequence. And just keep going for 20 plus years and then that this must be possible to solve. Every single modeling they did, they had all these rods where you place atoms and then you use a ruler and you measure things, you measure angles, and then you sit down with paper and pen and then, you know, based on the relative positions on these atoms, I predict that I would get an X-ray scattering plot that would look roughly like this, and then you go in and measure the X-ray scattering plot and see if your model is right. And it's not quite right, we're going to need to move that up, them up just one centimeter here, and then you go back and calculate again. There is a reason why it took 20 years. So the tour the force behind this is simply insane. And they also, he also got the Nobel Prize for this, together with uh, John Kendrew, who determined myoglobin in parallel. This is the other thing that's so amazing. You mentioned this before, hemoglobin and myoglobin. It turns out that they look almost the same. Myoglobin is one subunit, hemoglobin is four subunits. They didn't know. They just happened to pick a protein that was almost the same in slightly, two slightly different forms. And both of them did it at the MRC in Cambridge. If you ever visit the, um, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, they still have a bunch of these models in the lobby. Uh, and it's simply astonishing to just look at them. This is hemoglobin today in a molecular model and everything that we do with computers. But this is how it all started. I'm going to come back to this because there is some other work related to that. Um, more modern stuff. This is one of the, this is actually not the first membrane protein we determined the structure for, but it's the first ion channel that a structure was published for. It's a small bacterial ion channel. That's very common because they're bacterial proteins, not just channels, they're bacteria are simpler, or you could argue more efficient than humans. They don't carry around a whole lot of extra craft and stupid complicated domains because they, they need to have a very, very efficient energy turnover. And that typically means that all bacterial structures are smaller, simpler, more compact, and that makes them easier to determine structures of. And that's why most structures we determine, we usually start out to use a bacterial model and determine the structure of the bacterial protein, and much later you can determine the structure of a corresponding human protein. 
Um, so this turns out to be a small P8 regulated channel. So depending on P8, it opens or closes. And it's almost the central part here. We, knew, we now know that it's almost identical to the one that you use for voltage-gated sensing. But the difference there is that you need a voltage-gated channel because you have a nervous system. Bacteria don't bother with the nervous system. Well, their intelligence isn't quite near yours, but when it comes to energy efficiency, you're not even close. The bacteria is a much more beautiful creature than we are. Um, this is the human one. And for, let's see if we get this right. Yes, so up here we have the central part with the helistat. So that part corresponds roughly to the bacterial part here. So you can see all the extra stuff that we're carrying around. And this, of course, this costs energy to build. But it enables us to do some pretty amazing things with our nervous system. There are some advantages to being human. Another of the very early channels, aquaporin. This is a similar small channel that lets water in and out of your cells. Which is good, because depending on pressure and everything, salinity, if you didn't have anything that you could control the volume of your cells, all your cells would explode if it would suddenly change in temperature or a level of salt or something. And most of us usually don't explode, and that's these channels let water in or out. So both Peter Ager and uh, Rob McKinnon, uh, they shared the 2003 Nobel Prize for chemistry for these molecules. And this is actually pretty fun, because I've given some of these slides are old, and the reason why I have these slides, a bunch of these Nobel Prizes we've actually been able to, I wouldn't necessarily say predict, but when you go through these Hall of Fame of important molecules, they tend to get Nobel Prizes sooner or later. So this is another molecule, the gene factory. Uh, the RNA polymerase. This is a molecule that reads DNA, opens up DNA, and then converts the DNA into RNA molecules. It's really, it's a gigantic enzyme. This would happen, in theory, this could happen spontaneously, but it would be so slow that life would not be possible. So that this enzyme converts DNA to RNA, and then we can send RNA on to something else. This is actually Roger Kornberg, who is in the Department of Structural Biology at Stanford, when I made my postdoc. Uh, I didn't do it with Roger, though, it was mine. Nobel Prize, I should know whether that. I think that was 2006 or so, also for chemistry. The other cool thing is that they pretty much, they got the Nobel Prize for one single paper. The paper that determined the structure of RNA polymerase II. So you think that people get a Nobel Prize for their career, but it's not true, it's for one paper. The second part of the gene factory is the ribosome, which when I was your age, we do something like this. Just as I said, we knew that there were two parts of it, but we knew nothing of the details. So what the ribosome does is that it takes this messenger RNA, and then you get inside here, you actually bind some amino acids, and then the ribosome stitches these amino acids together. Exactly the reaction that I spoke about, right? That we get one amino acid binding to the next one. And then the ribosome puts out what you call the nascent chain. And this chain is where proteins grad, they probably start to fold already in the nascent chain, uh, sorry, in the exit tunnel, but we don't know the details. Right? And then depending on, if it's a globular protein, it should just go out in the water. If it's a membrane protein, it should somehow go out in the membrane. I'll come back to that too later. Three famous people, Tom Stites and Peter Moore at both at uh, Yale University and uh, Venki Ramakrishnan at LMB Cambridge. Nobel Prize 2009, and this is fun because I had the, I had this slide before 2009. I should start putting up these up online or something that you can show that it's prediction. G protein coupled receptors, and again, I don't expect you to know these proteins by heart. It's just an example of understanding how important protein structure is. For a long time, we said that nobody will ever determine the structure of a G protein coupled receptor. Companies spend billions of dollars trying to determine that because they are so everything that has to do with signaling in your cells is controlled by deep protein coupled receptors. And everybody had given up until suddenly Brian Kubilka at Stanford and Ray Stevens almost at the same time, but Brian Kubilka was earlier, showed that they had managed to overexpress, purify, and crystallize the GPR and determine the structure of a beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And that was, of course, an overpriced too but not to Ray Stevens, just to Brian and Brian's former advisor. And today we have more than 25 structures of these, and there are even a bunch of these structures that are not publicly available, but that pharmaceutical companies have crystallized internally because there is so much money involved in this. It's insane how many drugs that are gonna target this, because this has to do, 
gigantic families. Everything that has to do with how cells communicate with each other. Super important. So one could even, you could even imagine yourself that do some sort of Nobel Prize somatics, that if you want to go after a Nobel Prize, you should likely head into structural biology. There's no other area that has gotten more Nobel Prizes than structural biology. And that's, I think that's partly because we become fascinated with these structures, but it's so obvious that before we have a structure, we don't know how something works. And when we have the structure, we can suddenly start to point and understand how things work. And if I had given this course a year or two ago, I would have stopped roughly there. X-ray crystallography had been the revolution. That is, X-ray crystallography is really the tool that allows us to change from the macroscopic world and go out, go down and see the atoms. But things change, and this is the amazing thing with science. So just two or three years ago, there's, there has been another method to try to determine structure, that's essentially microscopy. Uh, you might know that a couple of years ago, there was a Nobel Prize for super resolution microscopy, right? And that gets you, do you know how, what resolution you can see with super resolution microscopy? Ballpark. So what, what would be the highest historical limit of a microscope? How, good, how far down can you see with a microscope if we forget about the Nobel Prize? Half the way. Yes. So the problem with the microscope is that you're limited by the wavelength of light. And that's in the ballpark of 500 nanometers or so. And a protein, these proteins are like 2 nanometers. Well, the resolution of an X-ray is like might be two angstrom or something, 0.2 nanometers. So 400 nanometers isn't, you're not even going to see the protein. If the protein fluoresces or something with light, you can see where in a cell a protein is, but you can't see the structure of the protein. Super resolution microscopy brings that down to roughly 20 nanometers through a bunch of tricks. Really cool technique. But 20 nanometers, 0.2 nanometers, it's not going to work. So what you can do though is that it has to do with the wavelength of light. But light would normally be photons, right? But there is nothing to say that we have to use photons. So what people started doing way before life sciences is that you can use electrons. Now the electrons is technically not a, we would normally, you might not think of an electron as a wave, but in physics, quantum mechanics, you have a, every particle has a wave and particle duality. So that if you just have a particle with very high energy, it's gonna start acting like a wave and the wavelength will depend on the frequency of that electron. So if you accelerate an electron with a couple of hundred thousand electron volts, it's gonna behave like a wave with a wavelength of say 0.1 angstrom or something. So you can actually use electrons for imaging. The only problem is that you can't use normal lenses, you're gonna need to use magnetic lenses, so that it's complicated. The other problem is that at the end you're going to need to detect these electrons and to make a long story short, shortcomings in these detectors meant that the best thing we could hope for an electron microscope was to see something like that was in the ballpark of say 5 angstrom or so. So you could see a shady blob corresponding to a protein but it was virtually impossible to see side chains or anything. And nobody cared about cryo-electron microscopy. It's just some poor bastard who has invested their careers in it until two years ago. <laughs> Uh, so this was a, an opinion piece in Nature that I also have on the site as well worth reading. Um, there was, this was an old song, and I forgot by who said, the revolution will not be televised, which was a big theme in the uh, Black Power movement in the US in the 1960s. So the title of this piece is, the revolution will not be crystallized. Suddenly, there was a new generation of semiconductor detectors that can detect electrons with a resolution of 1.7 angstrom. And this was like it's sudden, from one month to another. And suddenly you get a bunch of the biggest group. Venki Ramakrishnan, for us, he got a Nobel Prize for his work on uh, X-ray crystallography. The entire lab has switched to cryo-electron microscopy. So this is very much led by the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. The cool thing with cryo-EM is that you can suddenly determine a structure directly of an individual particle. Forget about overexpression. Forget about purification. Forget about crystallization. Those were kind of the three hard steps to a protein. Suddenly it's a matter of getting protein structures in days or weeks instead of months or years. And the difference, you have this uh, article on Monday, the difference with x-ray as I explained before, with x-ray you have a fairly large sample, at least a milligram, and then you somehow get a diffraction, and this diffraction pattern you then let a computer interpret. It builds an interference, and then you can interpret the pattern here and try to get the structure back. With cryo-electron microscopy, you have a very tiny frozen protein sample. And that's the cryo part. We dip it in liquid methane. 
typically 100 amount of protein or something. And then we have a lens, which is not really an optical lens, but a magnetic lens. And with a lens, we actually create a real image. So it's not just a diffraction pattern, but this is a real image, but you can imagine how noisy it's going to be, right? And they can see particles. So the way we then do this is that you take thousands or even millions of images, and then we let computers sort this out. Because there is one small complication. Imagine that this is a car, but you're getting two-dimensional images of the car. It's like taking a car and then slicing through the car with a very sharp knife. And then you're going to get a million random slices through the car. And from these one million random slices, you're not going to need a computer to try to design what is the three-dimensional structure of every single component in the car. It works, but it takes weeks of computer time. So this was not even possible before we had the latest generation of computers. And here, I think there are two potential Nobel Prizes. First, Richard Henderson for his method development work here, and it could happen very soon. The other one is Yifan Cheng, who is in San Francisco. Uh, one of them would determine some of the first structures. So this is a typical old cryo model of this TRP1 protein. So this is a... Uh, receptor that is sensitive for pain and heat, uh, and it's a channel that, so we, uh, when you have certain things like capsaicin and chili peppers, they will bind to this receptor and that will generate nerve signals that you interpret as heat. This would be the traditional cryo image. You see just the gray blob here, so you could see the shape possibly, but there's no way you could see any atomic detail. And these are the images with these new detectors. You might still think that this is noisy, and it is. But this is suddenly enough resolution that we can start to trace in individual side chains and everything. And then you get these beautiful structures of the entire protein. And this could very well be an overpriced in the future too, just because it's the first high resolution one. I think this is a really good place to take a break. Um, and then I'm going to get back and talk a little bit about the diversity and everything after the break. So let's get started again. So just to summarize with this TRPV1 channel, that's a potential Nobel Prize. This capsaicin molecule, exactly what does not so important, this one, it binds out here in a subunit that's actually very similar to the voltage-gated channels. But in this case, instead of being activated by a voltage, it's, it's being activated by the binding of a molecule. And when these molecules bind, you again open the central pore and it conducts ions, which feeds to a nerve signal. So nature tends to reuse simple building blocks. Because there are simply, there are not that many. If you need something to move or influence another domain, and that's something that comes back over and over and over again if you see structural biology, which is also intimately related to intelligent design. Because if you ever heard about the argument of intelligent design, is like how would some, how would create something like an eye? There is nothing that create an eye by pure evolution because it's not really until the eye works that the body has any use for it. And the way this works is really that. Complicated things are built from many small building blocks. Nature tends to reuse the building blocks. The building blocks already exist somewhere else in the genome, but the cell repurposes for something else. So, for instance, a voltage-gated channel being turned into a pain receptor. So, the reason for this diversity is twofold. Um, one of them is, as we mentioned, we have a pretty amazing sequence of amino acids here, but at face value, this is just a long string of amino acids. Just because you have many different amino acids doesn't really cause anything special. Um, there are other examples of polymers, the plastic bags you buy. And the plastic bag isn't really characterized by being able to perform all these functions. So the special things with proteins is that they're not homopolymers, but heteropolymers. You have a different composition of amino acids, and it's also very specific. And that, in turn, means that we get a lot of, A, a lot of possible different ways in which these can interact, but also these chains, with the exception of the yellow bonds here, these chains are very, very flexible. They can exist in lots of different conformations. I'm not sure if you brought this up in the bioinformatics course, but there is a classical example where you can toy a little bit about this, that how many conformations is there for a typical protein? And if we're going to get back to what these two angles are, but if there are, say, two angles per amino acid that can move, and we sample those in, say, 10 degree intervals, that would mean there are at least 36 different ways we can put each amino acid in. And if you then have a 100 residue protein, that would be 36, well, something like 36 squared to the power of 100, which is something like 10 to the power of 308. And this is actually fun, because if you try to put this in a computer, you're going to get an overflow. 
that number is so large that you can't even represent it in double precision on a computer. Uh, so it's an insanely large number. Only one of those is the native structure. How true is that one last statement that, all, that there's only one native structure? We'll come back to that. Good question. <laughs> Uh, so what happens is that if you look at these bonds, um, they can go through what you call an isomerization. Um, that you can rotate bonds in different ways, and when you rotate bonds in different ways, they can either be, you can have things on different sides, which is called trans, or you can have these two groups on the same side, which is called cis. Um, and I'm just realizing this is probably going to, you know what, I'll skip that slide and start this one first. Um, if, we, if you think about just in general, how can a large molecule move? The simplest thing would, of course, be you could imagine these bones vibrating, like being stretched or compressed, right? The book goes through this in some detail. Um, I'm going to need to gloss this over a bit because we won't be able to prove this until tomorrow. But it turns out that if you use infrared spectroscopy, we can see these vibration peaks very well. And they're roughly 7 times 10 to the power of 13 hertz or so. And you can actually show that a frequency corresponds directly to an energy in physics, and why I will show you tomorrow. And it turns out that at room temperature, roughly 300 Kelvin, there is simply so little energy that there is hardly any of these bonds that are going to be excited. The bonds are not going to be vibrating. They're kind of more like stiff rods. They're just in the quantum chemical ground states. So with a little bit of hand waving, you can trust me that I say bond vibrations are irrelevant for protein motions. The angles can vibrate a bit, say up to five degrees or so, but it's not really going to be important. It makes the protein a little bit softer, but it's not going to change their motions at all. And for this reason, that the only thing you really have is the torsions. So if you start to look at a chain like this, if we can't, we can't move the bonds and we can't move the angles, the only thing left is we can rotate around some bonds. So what happens if you rotate, so this is a side chain in a protein, what happens if you rotate that bond? That small one. Not much. Not a lot, right? You get these hydrogens rotating a bit. Sure, we might have had an arginine side chain here, and then you would have an arginine side chain whispering here, but it's not really going to change anything. If you rotate the peptide bond, what's going to happen? Well, remember, what did I say about the peptide bond? This was a trick question. <laughs> you can't rotate it. It's stiff. It's one of those bonds. You can rotate it, but in practice, not. it won't happen. Is it just when it's produced that you can... Exactly. You can produce it in two different forms. I'll get back to it in a second. But there are, also, there are two bonds that we actually can rotate. The bond just before this, this atom in the center of each amino acid is called the alpha carbon. And that's just chemical nomenclature, it's the first carbon that we start the entire amino acid from. So the bond just before the alpha carbon, but it's from the nitrogen to the carbon, and then the bond just after it, from the alpha carbon to the normal carbon, both those are free. They're normal bonds that you can rotate around. And for that reason they have very special names. You can, if this is a molecule where you have the preceding amino acid, we can kind of draw, because this is a peptide bond, right, so that's stiff. So you can draw a plane here, and then after the alpha carbon, we can also draw a plane to the next peptide bond. So both of these will be almost entirely rigid and planar. But you can rotate that plane, and you can rotate that plane, and that corresponds to rotation around the first bond and the second bond here. That's pretty much all the important degrees of freedom you have in a protein. It's a bit oversimplified, but the first approximation. And because these are so important, they have special names. And these names you need to learn. They're called phi and psi. And, and this is one of those things you realize in the highs that had we been sparking, we would have called them names that are slightly more different. But sorry, you're going to need to live with it. And you need to know which is which here. Um, rather than try, in principle, you can try to remember exactly what atoms are involved here. What I would recommend you do, just remember the order. First phi and then psi. When you're going from the N terminal to the C terminal in the direction of the sequence, the one before each alpha carbon is the phi, the one after the alpha carbon is the psi. So what do you do then if I suddenly ask you, well, what atoms are involved in this portion? So this is where you need to start doing the One of the defining characters of physicists is that we are remarkably lazy. Uh, physicists do not like to learn things by heart. 
So when somebody asks you to do climbing, you, you start to draw your protein. And you, well, you don't have to care about the site. And there is a nitrogen and the alpha carbon and the carbon. And then you have a nitrogen, alpha carbon, and the carbon. If you know that, and if you know that one of these bonds is just before the carbon and the other one just after the alpha carbon, you can define this with paper and pen. So you don't have to know it by heart. And that's one of the reasons why I like physics. Don't try to remember things. Think and rewrite it if you have to. So there's two of these per residue, pi psi, and that's of course when this argument I had before, I said that imagine that there are two degrees of freedom per residue. Um, there are lots of other things you can rotate, but the thing is that if you rotate these bonds, it's going to have global effect. Rotating this bond will change the orientation of the rest of the chain. Anything I rotate in the side chain will just have a local effect. And these dihedral angles, if you're not used to thinking that, the way we define this is really that you have three atoms always define a plane, right? So if you have four atoms here, atoms I, J, and K, they define one plane here, the blue one. And then J, K, and L define a second plane, the red one. And this dihedral or torsion angle, that is literally just the angle between these planes. But of course, there are two angles here, right? There is an angle here, and there's also an angle. Which one should it be? Should it be the larger angle here or the smaller angle there? So this is the bad thing in science. If there are two ways to do it, Polymer people have decided on one standard, and biochemistry people have decided on another standard. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to remember which is which. This doesn't really matter from the point of view. Can you? you can look at them. You will be able to derive this later, so don't worry too much about that for now. Uh, what you should rather think in terms of, it's, it might, rather than thinking in terms of angles, it's what you need to realize is that trans is if you have two important or large groups, or in this case the entire chain here and the entire chain there, Trans is when they are on opposite sides, and cis is when they are on the same side. That you need to know. The exact angle definitions, you can always look that up if you need to. But the cool thing is that if you do this, and if we then use this definition that you had, we can start to plot this. There are a bunch of protein structures available in the protein data bank. So if for every amino acid we put one angle phi here on the x-axis, and another angle psi on the y-axis, Every black dot here is a, an example for a proper protein, because here it doesn't really matter so much. So you do see that these cluster, they're not randomly distributed. So there is one big area here where it's common to find them. There's one area here, and then there are some smaller areas. So you hardly find anything here. Why is that? Because there's no room. Exactly. If you have a long chain, and you can actually, you, can, you should be able, we can actually have a look at that with the molecular toolkit later. I didn't find the break. There are some orientations where the chain will simply bump into itself. And then you can't put it there no matter how much you would like to. It's physically impossible. It would be too expensive. So it turns out that in practice there are not at all 36 square different combinations. Yes, there is a bit of variation here, right? But you could argue this is one confirmation and that is likely another one. So there is less freedom in these than you think. With a couple of exceptions. Remember that some proteins were special? Glycine had lots of regions where it can be. Why is that the case? It's so small. It's so small, so it has fewer things that bump into others. And then proline, on the other hand, that poor guy can almost only be in one combination. And that's because proline has these loops where it bends back on itself. And because proline bends back on itself, it has hardly any freedom at all. So you can even see here, there's only one value for phi that's even possible. And then there are two different values for psi. While general ones have slightly more freedom. So proline even uh, screws up the previous residue here, that the residue just before a proline doesn't have a whole lot of freedom either. This is going to be important when we get back to proteins, so let's see it. Sorry, and there we have that. And now I can show you that slide again. Because in general, over this peptide group, it turns out most proteins like to have the peptide group in trans shape, so that they have the oxygen, the CO group, and the NH group on different sides, so that it's stretched out. But proline is an exception. Uh, for proline, you can actually, you usually have cis form. 
And this means that proline usually kinks the chain a bit. But it's more complicated than that, that you can actually have both cis and trans. It's usually cis, but occasionally trans for proline. So whenever it comes to protein structure prediction or something, proline is complicated. Imagine you have a bioinformatics sequence. You have a thousand residues. And I just swap one residue from a glycine to a proline. Now, bioinformatics in general would tell you that that's, it's just one residue of a thousand. It's essentially the same sequence. That's not going to change it. But if it is a proline, it likely will. Because if you put this proline right in the middle of a helix, you're going to get a kink in the alpha helix. The proline, and that's the reason why proline are known as helix breaker, if you ever try to predict secondary structure in the bioinformatics course. And the reason that is a very physical property of proline, proline destroys the local secondary structure. And I'm going to jump over there. I should have had that slide in a different place. Sorry. So these diagrams are called Ramach, sorry, um, I didn't mention that. These are called Ramachandran diagrams when you put the phi. Uh, angle on one axis and the psi on the other one, and it tells you what structures are possible or not. And this brings us to two very famous people in this field. First, Christian Antonsen, Danish scientist. Uh, this relates to your question. Christian Antonsen postulated in the 1950s that proteins always adopt the structure that corresponds to the global minimum and free energy. Uh, you don't need to understand what the free part is now. We'll talk about that tomorrow. This is an amazing result. Remember how many degrees of freedom there were, that 10 to the power of 300. And Christian postulated that this always, it's determined by physics. There is no magic living substance. It's not the body that uses energies to fold the protein into a specific shape. It's entirely governed by physics. How do you think he argued for that? And what do you think he used to prove it? There is a way more beautiful result. But imagine yeah. This experiment on every protein. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So it took a small protein, and then it showed that you can put this protein in a test tube. There is no cell, there is nothing special, it's just protein in the test tube. We can heat it, or actually they use urea, so they can, with a very high level of uric acid, you can denaturate the protein, destroy the structure. But then he removed the urea again, and then he saw that the protein recovered this function. There is no cell involved. So you can show that this peptide sequence that we had destroyed, so it's unfolded, it will spontaneously refold in a test tube without any cellular environment. Uh, they got the Nobel Prize for this in 1964, I think. I might be a year or two off there. Uh, it's an astonishing result. Do you think it's true in general? Does it hold? You have strong bonds that can, can be re. I really, the amazing thing is that it actually almost always holds. For every single protein. The funny thing, they showed this for one relatively small protein, right? For all small single domain proteins, this is in principle true. And this is the reason why now we can fold proteins in a computer. We just apply the laws of physics, add water and everything, and we can show that the protein folds. It takes a gigantic amount of time. Uh, unfortunately, more than we can use in the lab up here. Maybe for a small sequence, but we can. This is the reason we can predict proteins completely on physics. And this is important because in bioinformatics, you predict protein structure based on the similarity to another protein. That would work even if you had some magic energy involved, right? You're just that's pattern recognition. Here we're talking about the laws of physics. But it's not always true. There's a famous saying that to every rule in biology, there is an exception. And the exception is like ion proteins. Uh, amyloids, there are these proteins that misfolded proteins, protein diseases uh, that Stanley Prusiner in particular pioneered, and we will come back to this later in the course too, but they actually turned out that in some cases there are diseases that appear to be spread that an agent that was neither a bacterium nor a virus. Yeah. And everybody saw they were wrong, yes, and those were prions. And at the time they didn't know what a prion was, but eventually they realized that prions are misfolded proteins. So these are likely proteins that somehow can interconvert into a different structure and one bad protein will somehow spread this bad structure to other proteins. And that's likely, so there are some proteins that appear to have multiple states, but that, that's complicated. But again, biology is a bit different from physics in biology. Overall, this is the rule. But did Amphenson propose that it was the global minimum and not any local minimum? 
Sorry? So because the big thing about that statement is that it must be the global domain. Yes. And a, another caveat here, this is single, small single domain proteins. There are some gigantic proteins where you might need chaperonins and everything. But here the question becomes, remember what I said about time scales, right? In many cases, I would argue the reason we need chaperonins and a lot of biological machinery is not because the native state is not the lowest energy, but because it would too, take too long for the protein to find that spontaneously. But that is debatable. Uh, this is a very interesting research field, actually. Ten, 20 years ago, most people would have said that this is always true. It's no longer as obvious anymore. And for membrane proteins, it might be, I should not say completely wrong since I'm recording this, but uh, there are some interesting ideas with membrane proteins where we're starting to change our view of how membrane protein folding works. Doesn't mean that it's right, it could be wrong, but that's the exciting thing about science. However, in that perspective, Cyrus Leventhal had a very famous paradox. So, paradox, so Cyrus said that, remember what I said, that make it even simpler, forget about the 36 states. In the, in the Ramachandran diagrams, we saw that there were typically two regions for each amino acid that there could be. Let's oversimplify, let's say each, pro, each amino acid can only have two different states. Even with two different states, there would be two to the power of 100 different conformations from a chain. If each of these conformations took you like a nanosecond or so to explore, it would still take the age of the universe for nature to pull this. And still this happens. Do you know how long it takes to pull the protein into your cells? Yeah, well, nanoseconds are a bit fast. I would say that microsecond, the very fastest ones, up to a second, the very slowest ones. So apparently it happens all the time in the cell. And this is a very famous paradox. We know that it's wrong, but we can't understand why. You can crack this later in the course, but it's not obvious. Um, the other thing that it so we summarize this thing, remember that I told the sequence to structure to function? We have an amino acid sequence, and what Amfield is basically saying is this white arrow. The amino acid sequence uniquely defines a 3D folded structure. And then what we haven't brought up now, but that we'll cover later on the course, that this structure, the way the amino acids are organized and everything here, will cause different proteins to fit each other, specific interactions. And this, think of this as a key and a lock, and this combination will lead to a unique function. But the arrows go down, they do not infer, structure does not infer sequence, and function does not infer structure. It might be very common for a specific protein with a function to have a specific structure, but it's not unique in the other one. Um, and then there are complications. So what Dan Vincent showed is what's called renaturation, that you can destroy a protein and then refold it again. Then there are, of course, a couple of exceptions here that complicate it a bit. You frequently have post-translational modification um, that you might bind or you might somehow change the chain. For insulin, that's actually the case. It's too slow, but we cut the chain in a complicated way. And for things like hemoglobin or so, we might have to bind other molecules to get the function. So it's a bit more complicated in practice, but this is also, I think, the power of physics. Don't think about the complications. If you focus on the complications, you're never going to get anywhere. So try to cut away the complications and focus on the essence. Yes, there are examples where on this end is not true, but the amazing thing that it appears to be true in 99.99% of all cases, and that's rather amazing. There's a Brian, Bob Robson had a famous, this is a bit corny, but it's all that I can, the great proteino. Uh, see his amazing split second leap from fully extended to tightly coupled twice nightly, and then there's this quote that you probably can't read. I don't know how he does it, live in thought, <laughs> 1966. Um, this polypeptide structure, there are a couple of other things. Um, we'll come back to that much later on, of course. We're going to talk a lot about Leventhal's paradox. Uh, there's one slight complication here. There is formally a omega bond in this peptide bond. In principle, that's almost always trans. For proline, it can vary. I don't think that you would ever work with the peptide bond, but it says you know phi and psi, suddenly you see an omega, and it's good to know what that omega stands for. And then in the side chains, side chains, depending on how long the side chains, we can have one or more bonds. The side chain bonds are usually called chi bonds, and then chi 1, 2, 3, depending on how far they are out from the alpha carbon. And these you can frequently, we are frequently really good at predicting these with bioinformatics. Predicting the global R ones and the global ones on the other end, that's hard. So what this does is that, 
this is really what will govern everything we know about protein structure. And we're going to come back to this later too, but the primary structure that you're really familiar from for bioinformatics, that is simply the sequence of amino acids. It's a bit stupid to call that structure, but the reason we call it structure is that everything else on the slide is called structure. So occasionally we call the sequence for primary structure. That's just the sequence of residues. Those Ramachandran diagrams I showed you meant that for most of these, there is pretty much only one or two regions they like to be. And this caused these very small regular pattern that are called secondary structures that we'll talk a little bit about in the next few slides. Secondary structure, in turn, will use its side chains to interact in even more and more complicated matters, what's called tertiary structure. Most of the pictures of proteins I've shown you are tertiary structures, so that's one chain that has been folded up. And for these very largest ion channels and everything, you typically have what we call a quaternary structure, that multiple chains, multiple domains like these that have typically been folded independently, these subunits then aggregate together and form an even larger protein. So the, the, um, the ion channels I showed you typically consist of five different chains, five copies of one chain. Helices you have probably seen before, so I'm not going to go through them in too much detail. Um, and also, I'm going to skip a couple of slides at the end here, so I'll give you some time to ask questions, um, and we'll take them tomorrow. I would argue that helices is by far the most stable structure, and we'll see why later on in the course. But the reason for this is it's a very local structure. This amino acid is interacting with an amino acid three or four residues away. It's not a matter of this really complicated landscape where you need to fold things with thousands of forces involved. It's something you, you only need to interact with your closest neighbors. Uh, in principle, there are lots of different helices. You don't need to understand the details of the helices, but you do need to understand that by far the most common helix is the alpha helix. And the alpha helix is characterized by each residue making hydrogen bonds to a residue that is four neighbors away. And you typically have an oxygen here, oh, not typically, you always have an oxygen here, so this carbon, oxygen, and then four residues away, you have a nitrogen and a hydrogen. That hydrogen loves to interact with that oxygen, and we'll come back to why later. That is the entire reason why alpha helices are stabilized. What's the 13? Mm -hmm. so, so the 13 really means that to get all the way to the same position you started from, you're going to need to go 13 residues here. So for an alpha helix, it's on average roughly 3.6 residues per turn. So 13 residues later, you're going to be back in exactly the same angle you started from. Um, don't bother about that. That's not so important. Uh, these other helices are not really important either, but I'm going to... An alpha helix, when you have these hy the hydrogen bonds, think of the hydrogen bonds, but that's really was how you're going to be able to tell them apart. When you hydrogen bond to something four neighbors away, that's going to be the most relaxed in the helical structures. And that's, again, the vast majority of all helices you're going to see in PDB are going to be alpha helices. It is possible for nature to take a helix and twist it harder. And rather than hydrogen bonding with something four residues away, it turns out that then you're hydrogen bonding with something three residues away. So you're just swapping them one turn. And that leads to a very tightly wound helix, and that's called a 310 helix, and you occasionally see that in PDB. And the pi helix is the opposite. That's one where we have five between them. That's, that pretty much never occurs. You can forget about the pi helix. Uh, we do see this one now and then in the PDB. Uh, in particular, those voltage-gated channels. So in the voltage-gated channels, we have those arginines. And normally, you have an arginine, and then three, four residues later, you have another arginine. Then they're going to be placed like a stair takes ladder here, all around the helix. But in this type of helix, you will get all the arginines on the same side. So that's likely why nature might use it. Uh, take home message here, out the helix, that we're hydrogen bonding to the residue four residues away. But there is another type of secondary structure element. So which one of these, if you just, you don't need to put in a helix, you can just take the residues and put them straight. Which one of these would be more stable? What's the difference between them? That's a beta strand. That's a beta strand, yes. Which is only, by itself, it doesn't, it's not, well, it's not local structure, it's a sheet. Um, and also it could just be a loop. So it's 
So the, the advantage here, of course, is, is way more flexible. So if you had some large residues here or something that don't like to be in an alpha helix, you can certainly argue that this is favorable. Uh, if you compare this to, is that this beta strand is really, oh, sorry, beta sheet on itself is not particularly stable at all because there's not a single hydrogen bond that it can make there or anything. But if we put several of these next to each other, then you're going to get these large extended beta sheets. And that turns out to be the critical difference that the alpha helix is a local structure. Remember that I said it was stable because it's forming bonds with its closest neighbors. So an alpha helix will form just with local interactions. And you can guess, that's a good thought question to think about it tomorrow. Could you say anything about how fast an alpha helix is likely to form? While a beta sheet, on the other hand, all the interactions here would have to be with some other strand, and that's going to be a residue from a different part of the protein. And that will give it quite different properties in the way they can form and everything. There even turns out that there are two different ways we can pack beta sheets. They can either be parallel, that they go in the same direction, or they can be anti-parallel. Anti-parallel is easy because you can just go up, down, up, down, up, down. When they are parallel, once we've taken our first sheet here, uh, sorry, expand here, we somehow need to get have another structure element to get back down here and then go up again and back down here and up again. But for both of these, they can form lots of hydrogen bonds between adjacent strands. You see both of them in nature. So what are beta sheets useful for? Imagine if you were the divine creator or something. <laughs> yes. I would literally, that's it's, it's a much smarter and possibly a smarter answer than you might actually realize. Uh, they literally, if it, so this is a small protein called FABP. Uh, I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, so here you have one layer, a beta sheet here. So beta sheet is multiple strands. And then if you can see, it's a bit faint in the background. You have a second layer of beta sheets in the background. Could you imagine what this protein could do? This is a hard question. Okay, I'll give you a little help. What if a special property of the beta sheets is that they tend to have alternate residues facing in and out, in and out. So if you now take every second residue here and make them water liking, hydrophilic, we put them on the outside. And every second residue, the other ones are hydrophobic, we put them so they face the inside. What would that give you? So it would be a lipid pocket, right? That could bind things that are fat. So FABP stands for fatty acid binding protein. And that's literally what the body uses to transport things like fatty acids to a membrane, for instance, that we want them, because the fatty acid itself is not water soluble. So it comes back to this nature essentially uses fairly simple thermodynamics to create different patterns. And this is something that would be virtually impossible to do with alpha helices. And this, of course, based, there is no intelligent design here. It's all based on evolution. But these, that's why they have very different properties that we will keep coming back to. So when do you think these structures were determined? And how? That's a good question, but it's wrong. This is I think this is more predicted by were, Venus Paul. They were predicted theoretically before the first X-ray structures of protein were determined. And it's a very famous paper. It's a set of eight papers in PNAS, 1951, uh, where they determined both the alpha helix and the pi helix. That's why I include the pi helix. And they, they basically they predicted every single helix. They predicted both parallel and anti-parallel beta sheets and everything before anybody had seen their structures. Just from physics theory? This one physics. And remember, this was in the 1950s. It's not like they had a supercomputer without a day, paper, and pen physics. It's pretty impressive, right? How long did that take? I have no that's idea. idea. Uh, that's significantly quite young version of Linus, and that's Corey, I think. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, Li Linus was a very fun character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is a review by Dave Eisenberg. I'm not going to ask you to read all these papers. I have put a review, recent review uh, by Dave Eisenberg of those papers. I think, it's, I think it's a fairly, we talked about before the role of theory versus experiments and everything. And again, this was at the time that people weren't even sure whether proteins have well-defined structure. 
So today, being able, I bet you could probably do this with a bit of work and everything. But uh, the key thing is that it's very, in hindsight, this was an obvious result. But they did this as a point where nobody was even sure whether there was any well-defined structure to a protein. And then they put it a bunch of years before the first protein structures came out. So all this early work led to all the investments and people being interested in determining structures. People spent a whole lot of work trying to determine structure experimentally too. Uh, and one of the most important molecules that people went after was a molecule DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, where our friend Linus Pauling was also very active. So this was a complicated circuit because you had a, DNA apparently gave out rise to different X-rays, but depending what was dry or whether it was wet. So whether it was a, it's a it was a crystal or somehow had water in it, so it completely different shapes, uh, structure, diffraction maps in X-ray. So there were a bunch of people both studying different uh, diffraction patterns. People come up with different models because again, we did not have the computers. You need to have a reasonable model and try to realize what makes sense here. So the structure of DNA was an important topic in the 1960s. Uh, and what, if you can actually start here, these are some of the first X-ray maps. And again, although this is not an X-ray course, but if you start looking at the specific diffraction patterns here, it turns out that you can relatively easy, by this character is X shaped you get here. That's a very strong indication that you have something helical, that's something going zigzag essentially from a structure point of view, back and forth, and it's crossing itself multiple times. So there were lots of consensus early on that there has to be some sort of helical structure to DNA. And what you see here, this is a paper by Linus, this is Linus Pauling's model of the structure of DNA published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 1953. So this he proposed that DNA was a trimer with the backbone facing inside and the basis pointing out. So pretty, and I would not call this failure, but I, we, again, in hindsight, we never show bad results, right? You can say lots of things about it, but it's not the structure of DNA. It's not bad. It certainly has the helical, I bet it has the exactly right helical periodicity to fit really well with this. But the problem with theory is that it's not always right. You can very easily go wrong, but you can go wrong in the experiments too. And, well, I think the less we say about stra that structure, the better it probably is. Um, but again, you can win Nobel Prize, even though you have some structures that are not necessarily first class. And then we had Rosalind Franklin in particular, uh, and based on Rosalind Franklin's X-ray map, you had two young rats in Cambridge, uh, Jim Watson and Francis Crick, who came up with a slightly different model of DNA. I'm not sure, do you know what their background was? Because you might think of yourself in a transdisciplinary, I'm not sure whether you can think of yourself as a physicist, chemist, or something. Like physicist and mathematician, right? No, so Jim Watson was trained as an ornithologist, <laughs> and... Uh, Francis Crick, who well, was a physicist. Now, of course, today we would call them molecular biologists because that's kind of their discoveries kind of found molecular biology together with Max Perutz and some others. As if you are in the middle, if you're doing interesting stuff, you're always going to feel that you're a bit cross disciplinary. Um, research is most interested in the point where the map is still white, um, and that's where we don't really have good names with it anymore. So, Watson and Crick come up with one key amazing result. Do you know what that was? So actually, do you, can you imagine, I'm not sure how much you know about DNA, but they came up with the reason why this one is wrong. So DNA on its backbone has a bunch of phosphate ions. And I'm not sure how much you know about phosphates. But it's a phosphate and then surrounded by a bunch of negatively charged oxygens. So there's a very large negative charge. Can you see any problem with that here? Exactly. So you would have a bunch of, uh, tons of phosphates here on right next to each other. The phosphates would rather like to be as far apart from each other as possible, right? So it's much smarter to put the phosphates on the outside and have these bases pointing inwards. So they came up, nasty people would say that Frank Crick did all the calculation and then you had Jim Watson just sitting and building the molecular models on Francis Crick's instructions, but I'm not gonna say that. Uh, this is a really cool paper that's available on Mondo. I think you should read it. It's one and a half page. Uh, and the way that they just propose a structure for the salt of deoxyribonucleic acid. 
and there's a beautiful formulation to the end of this paper that, that says roughly, it has not escaped our notice that our proposed model also provides a mechanism for the transfer of the genetic material, period. And that is, that is pretty much the birth of everything we do in this building in Andy, so it's a beautiful British understatement that it has not escaped our notice. They didn't say more about it. In a paper today, you would of course have three follow-up papers focusing just on that aspect and everything, and they would have spent six, pa six pages and supporting information in the original paper. Read it, because I think it's a really fun way that has funded much of what we do. Um, the sad thing, uh, they are the um, sad, well, I wouldn't say that it's sad. This paper was published in 1953. Do you remember when they got their Nobel Prize? Eight, six, eight, three. 62. Sadly, by that time, people have frequently criticized that Rosalind Franklin should have had the Nobel Prize too. Um, I think that's a bit unfair because Rosalind Franklin unfortunately died uh, from cancer very young. So had she, had she been alive, I think she would have shared it, um, but we won't know. Yeah. Uh, but an interesting question, why did it take nine years for them to get the Nobel Prize? To be coping? Like, experimental? So I'm going to leave you hanging. I'm not going to tell you to no. think about that. So the cool thing is that all the notes in Nobel Prizes are secret for 50 years. In 1962, those notes, the secrecy was lifted in 2012. <laughs> so since a couple of years, we actually know the reason for the Nobel Committee why they awarded them the Nobel Prize in 1962 and why not in 1954 or something. I will tell you tomorrow. But think about why, why it took nine years. It's an important lesson of science. Um, so there is one last thing that, uh, just to follow up on the Ramachandran diagrams that I showed you. So the point with this Ramachandran diagrams is, of course, that these regions that are really well populated, they correspond to alpha helices and beta sheets. Uh, and some of these other strange regions are disordered places, but they're not really that important. But that's why we have these two regions, so that's pretty much... The reason why we don't have more secondary structures in proteins is that there are only two regions in the Ramachandran diagrams that are really favorable. And uh, that's, nature has used that to form the se stable secondary structures. That doesn't mean that all proteins will form that, but here we have this interplay between physics on the one hand and evolution on the other. Because there are patterns that are possible, there are patterns that are possible and that will be very stable. Evolution will naturally cause proteins to mutate to reach those patterns because they are stable. Even evolution could never cause you to reach this area because there is nothing stable there. And same thing that the, re the reason why, while we might think that these are stable, that there are certainly many residues that won't be stable in, say, an alpha helix. But if things are not stable in an alpha helix, that protein will likely not have a very stable structure. And if a protein won't have a stable structure, it will likely not form. And that brings you to another question that we'll bring up later in the course that you could think about. Will all sequences form proteins? What is the likelihood that the sequence will form proteins? Is like 50%, 10%, 1%, 0.1%. Do you have any guess? That all sequences for form some if, you, if, if you just create a random sequence, what is the likelihood that a random sequence will fold into a protein? You mean a functional thing or just forget about thing? function, just structure. A well defined structure. Now not just secondary structure, but a well defined tertiary structure. Well, I think it'd be point one. Mm -hmm. So your guess was an insanely high overestimate. Think of ten to the power of minus ten or minus twenty. So there's virtually no random sequence that will form stable proteins. So that there is something nature has done with 4.3 billion years of evolution here. Uh, there, had a, there are a couple of slides on uh, stabilization of... Actually, we have 20 minutes. I can include them after all. Uh, because they're not... The reason for including these slides is that I'm going to come back to them tomorrow. So that's why I figured that it's good for you to have seen it a bit. Um, when it comes to helices, if you look at this peptide bond, atoms have charges. Even ion, you're used to thinking that ions have a full charge, plus or minus one or plus or minus two, right? But it turns out that all atoms in a large molecule, some of them draw elect attract electrons better than others. And the ones that attract electrons, like an oxygen in this case, will have roughly minus half the charge localized there. 
Uh, nitrogen will also attract electrons that will also be negatively charged, but the hydrogen here will be positively charged. And this will lead to that these peptide bonds in particular will have a relatively strong dipole that's corresponding more negative charge here and more positive, more negative charge to, towards the oxygen and more positive charge towards the hydrogen. Uh, and that's a unit called d by, and you'll need to know what it is. Um, but the difference in charge over a very small distance will lead to a fairly strong dipole here. But it's just one dipole, that doesn't really matter. Or does it? Well, the key thing is that in a helix you don't have one dipole. So what happens, do you remember when we showed this alpha helix that one, hyd one oxygen here formed a hydrogen bond to a hydrogen four residues away? So what happens gonna, when you line up all this in an alpha helix, all these dipoles add up, they point in the same direction. So when you have at least 20 residues here, you're gonna have a 20 times stronger dipole because all these dipoles line up in the same direction. Actually, they point in the other direction. So it's gonna be like you had a positive charge in the helix here and as if you had a negative charge in the helix there. So a helix is gonna be like a relatively charged small rod. That you can imagine is a purely physical detail until you start seeing that. Remember that KCSA channel that Rob McKinnon determined, the first membrane protein? This is a very, very special protein because it conducts ions, but it's selective for one type of ion. Actually, I can show you all the information I can talk about. It. So here you have a pore, and then you have what we call, you have a large cavity here where water is, and here you have the so-called pore filter. So this is the one that selects what the ions goes through. And in this particular, the KCSA, the K just means that it's an ion, that it's an ion channel that is conducting potassium ions, K. So it's conducting potassium ions, but not sodium ions. Can you see any problem with that? Without necessarily reading the notes. Potassium is bigger. So this is a hole that lets through big things, but does not let holes through small things. And to me, that's a bit of a special hole, right? How do you stop small things from going through while you let through big things? You, you did? No. Even bigger. So what happens here is that you have all these helices, they're dipoles, right? So think of these like some sort of beams pointing in. So they, when an ion comes here, an ion is just, just an ion. Any ion in reality will carry around what? Water. So it's have water, if you have a positive ion, it, water will turn its oxygen towards the positive ion. And this is a bit of electrostatics, but the smaller an ion is, the closer the water can get to that positive charge, and then it's gonna bind the water harder. So the smaller an ion is with the same charge, it's gonna bind this water stronger. So what these four helices do is that they create, they essentially create a binding site for the ion here, and stabilize the ion. So if an ion such as potassium, which is relatively large, that doesn't bind this water so strong. So for potassium, the potassium ions actually lets go of its hydration water and is happy to be stabilized by these four helices instead. While the sodium is so small, so the sodium, the sodium can't essentially, the sodium can't be stabilized by all four helices at the same time. So it's basically jumping between one of them at a time. And it's also binding its water too hard. So the sodium won't let go of its hydration water. So the potassium ion, as an ion it's larger, but when the potassium has lost its hydration water, it's really easy for it to go through the pore here. The sodium doesn't lose its hydration water. And when the sodium has all its hydration water, it's way too large and can't get through. The cool thing with this is that this is so efficient, because you can imagine that this is going to be really complicated high energy barriers or something, that to the potassium ion, this is as efficient as if it was just a hole here. The potassium ions are within one, and one order of magnitude of the pure diffusion rate. So the, the potassium ion doesn't even feel a bump. It's just going straight through. It doesn't see anything stopping it. So how many sodium ions do you think this protein happens to leak through? Mm. Well, this is nature, right? So there's always be some that have for one in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000, one in a billion. Yeah. This is pretty amazing. There is no normal machine. That, we have more errors in computers, and then I'm not talking about the program, I'm talking about the hardware. 
So you have these miniature machines that consist of a couple of thousand atoms, but they have both efficiencies and selectivities that are insanely high. They're orders of magnitude better than anything man-made has ever done. And this is, of course, one of the reasons that I long-term we would like to engineer things this way, because this is going to be way more efficient than doing things with semiconductors. Um, Water is also a very special molecule. We're going to come back to water lots, uh, lots of times later in the week, but I just want to... There's this concept that water just consists of an oxygen and hydrogen, and you probably don't think of water as being charged, but I'm going to tell you that it is. On average, the oxygen has roughly minus 0.8 unit charges, so it's almost like it's a negative ion here, and each hydrogen has almost plus half a charge. So water, while you might think of water as a normal neat liquid, water has tons of extremely strong bonds between hydrogens and oxygens. And this is actually where you probably, you might have seen some of these classical experiments where you have a cumber or something and you can get what the, uh, you can deflect a, a, a piece of running water. And the reason for that is that there are so strong dipoles in the water that when you have a comb and have charged that electrostatically by combing your hair or something, the dipoles in the water will attract the comb. Have you ever thought about how hard it is to heat water compared to ethanol or something? Ethanol is pretty much like water, right? Almost the same density. Almost the same viscosity. They're kind of similar as liquids. It's extremely expensive to heat water. It's like five or six times more expensive to heat water than it is to heat ethanol. And the reason for that, when you're pumping things into, when you're pumping energy into water, we have to start breaking these bonds. And that's why water is such an excellent carrier of energy in general. It can store lots of energy. But this is also going to be really important for biophysics, as we'll see later this week. Um, I'm not going to speak... Well, so the, the reason behind all this is really has to do with electrostatics interactions, and we're going to talk more about specific interactions tomorrow, but the special thing with electrostatics is that it's a super strong force and it decays very weakly. This is one over the distance. So if you take two unit charges separated by roughly one angstrom, the energy for that is going to be in the ballpark of 300 kilocalories per mole. Is that a large or small end? It's an insanely large energy. The bond rotations might be two kilocalories per mole, and these are the typical energies you see in a protein. So that's when you can have electrostatic interactions, protein or nature will do almost anything it can to fulfill electrostatic interactions because they're so good. And equally, if they have the same sign, you're going to get an insanely strong repulsion. And that is the reason why Corwin's model for DNA was so bad. Electrostatic, doing bad things with electrostatic is pretty much a guarantee that it's a wrong structure. Um, they also decay as one over R, which means that they're very, well, they're long range and influence things throughout the molecule, but uh, we'll learn more about that later. And that leads to the last concept that I'll bring up today, the hydrogen bonds. So what was a bond? What type of different bonds do you know in chemical bonding? Ionic. So ionic, ionic is a good part. Um, ion bonds are complicated because in a crystal, they're really, in a crystal they share the electrons. But the second you dissolve, say, sodium fluoride into water, it's going to be separated into sodium ions and chloride ions, right? So they diffuse around. Uh, what you typically have in a protein, if you have, say, one negatively charged group and a positively charged group, we typically call that a salt bridge. So that's essentially an ion bridge. They are extremely strong because they would be this pure electrostatic interaction. The typical bonds in a molecule would be what we call a covalent bond, and they're even stronger because it's electron resonance, right? They will, they will never, a protein will never break bonds during normal action. That will require an enzyme or something to create, to build the polypeptide chain. But then there are these bonds that are, they're kind of electrostatic, like the ones I showed you. Minus 0.8 charge here in the oxygen. And then you have the hydrogen here with this plus 0.5. What of course happens here is that these electrons start to attract each other so much that they, they almost form a bond, but not quite. And I know this sounds horrible, but it is fussy. Uh, it's a sliding scale, so this is much stronger than normal just electrostatic interaction. If you start to look at this, it's going to look as if the bond is present almost all the time. It's fairly rigid, but we can occasionally break it. In ice, virtually every single hydrogen will be part of hydrogen bond, and each oxygen will be part of two hydrogen. That's where it forms bonds with two hydrogens. 
And the energy for this, this is something you need to know. It's roughly 45 kilocalories per mole. And compare that, the energy for rotating a bond might be 2 to 5 or something. So it turns out that this is an energy range that's very important. Something that's 0.1 kilocalories per mole, you're not, that's not even a speed bump. And I'll come back to why tomorrow. And yes, in the range of 4 to 5 start to matter. And if it's a 500 or a 1,000, it's so large that we will never get over it biologically at room temperature. These hydrogen bonds is the reason why, for the entire reason for DNA stabilization. So this is one strand, and this is another. And every single base pair here, guanine, guanine and cytosine, for instance, they form three hydrogen bonds between each other, while adenine and thymine, they form two hydrogen bonds. And that's the reason why we have the specific so-called Watson-Crick base pair which is also something they postulated based on their model. This is the reason why we have the genetic, the transfer of genetic information. Because if you split this, we're gonna have two copies and then each copy will recruit a specific type of molecule that pairs up with our hydrogen bonds. So what happens if I said that these are formed in ice? What happens when you melt ice? So in water, do you have hydrogen bonds in water? So I said, in principle, at absolute Kelvin, you would have, sorry, at zero point, at zero Kelvin, absolute zero, every single hydrogen bond we formed, you would have two hydrogen bonds per oxygen and one per hydrogen. So at room temperature, on average, poop. So <coughs> ideally, we would have two hydrogen bonds per water. At room temperature, how many hydrogen bonds per water do you think we have? So that's a good question, but... Let's see if we can show more here. Yes. Uh, it might be a bit hard to see here. So this is water, a simulation of water actually at roughly room temperature. It turns out that you have roughly 1.7 hydrogen bonds per water even at room temperature. And because there is such an insane amount of energy stored in these hydrogen bonds that nature will do almost anything it can to try to keep them fulfilled. Hydrogen bonds are actually the reason why most proteins are, the reason why things are water-soluble versus not water-soluble has to do with these hydrogen bonds that I will show you later this week. Uh, but it's not really until eventually when water turns into gas phase that we will break all the hydrogen bonds. But at any normal temperature, to first approximation, we are closer to ice than we are to gas. So almost all hydrogen bonds are paired in water all the time. And nature, what nature will try to do, it's going to try to rotate the water or the protein or the protein side chains. So we will try to do almost anything we can to keep these hydrogen bonds because we gain five kilocalories per mole for every single hydrogen bond we can form. Or conversely, we lose that energy if we don't form the hydrogen bonds. I'm not sure that I have, yes. Oh, well, that's just a summary slide, but basically, so we see in water here, they are formed virtually all the time. They're the reason we have the structure we have in DNA, and they're the reason we're the base pairing in DNA, but that's just a repetition. I think we have 10 minutes remaining there. I realized this was an insane amount of new slides for some of you at least, but this is kind of deliberate. I want to get you started reading the book. Uh, hydrogen bonds in proteins we will talk about tomorrow. So what I would suggest, after what we're going to do, first, this was chapter one and two of this book, Protein Physics. Do read through them. In this particular case, I think I actually covered virtually everything you need to know in the lecture. And that's why I pushed through a lot of slides. So that try to skim through chapter one and two, but also try to start looking at chapters three and four so you're a bit prepared tomorrow and can ask some tough questions. Um, I know Magnus, my colleague, he kept doing a, I asked him to do a course evaluation at KTH. And Basically, the one recommendation from previous students is that read the book. <laughs> Keep reading the book and try to don't put off reading the book until two weeks into the course and everything. Uh, the advantage is that it's a physics book, so it's short. It's no 100-page chapters, but there are, there are other 15 pages per chapter or so. And if there are things that I haven't covered at all, we will likely not bring them up. But you can ask me about anything there. I also, to help you a bit, I wrote down 20, I thought, but it's only 19 study questions. Uh, some of these things I've covered here, some of I haven't, and the simple reason, I think the book describes, all of this is described either in the book or things I've covered here. If you know the answer to the vast majority of these, uh, you know the chapter well, and I'm going to try to do that for every lecture, so you have something to follow there. 
what I'm going to do tomorrow is uh, that we're going to repeat or cover some of the things I glossed over a little bit today. But we're going to look at these interactions, charges, and electrostatics in proteins a lot and try to what does this really mean and why do electrostatics stabilize proteins the way it does. Uh, we're going to revisit our friends the hydrogen bonds and the peptide group. But that's roughly half the lecture, and the second half of the lecture, we're going to start to dig in, what does this then mean? Why do we see some of these things? Why is it good to have things that have low or good energy, and why is it bad to have things that have high energy? And this has to do with a concept called the Boltzmann distribution in physics, uh, which is really a statistical mechanics. We're going to bring this up in a fairly easy way, so don't worry, you're not going to have a need to insane amounts of mathematics here. Uh, and in particular, Historically, we would derive this entirely with equations. And then eventually, when you have all these equations and proofs, you will start to apply it. What Bjorn and Dari have designed, they have designed a very simple labs where we're going to try to just have things moving between different states. Super simple problem. You can even write it yourself from scratch. And then we're going to try to observe the Boltzmann distribution instead and see if you can learn things by observing rather than deriving it. And I, I think that could be a fun, different way of approaching it. But this is going to be an extremely powerful way to start looking at these probabilities in general. That in turn will be related to the concept called free entity. I will likely hold off with entropy all the way until Wednesday, but I might touch it a little bit tomorrow. And then on Wednesday we will really go through entropy and free entity. But I think that's all I have today. Do you have any questions for me?